is the most wonderful time of the year, folks. It is Christmas week. Christmas is only four days away. And this right here is episode 140 of YWC Football Talk. And not only is it a big episode because 140, obviously, look at this time last year, I was only at episode number 50. But for this episode, the Christmas episode, I had to get what is known as the biggest rivalry in the history of this podcast on. I got Danny. I got Big Rat. Fellas, how are we doing tonight? Hey, man. Had to give everyone a little uh, Christmas gift right here of me dunking on Big Rat once more. Uh, glad to be on. Always a pleasure. <laughs> and uh, look forward to continuing this uh, this feud. Yeah, I mean, his Danny is uh, terrified that his Dolphins under nine and a half ticket that he was chirping so much about is all of a sudden starting to look a little scary in these last couple of weeks here. So <laughs> I feel pretty comfortable with where I'm at. Danny, Danny had a series of tweets last year saying that Tua was QB4 in his quarterback class. He said it over and over and over and over and over again. And as Jalen Hurts commits two turnovers on back-to-back series, it's just it's just laughable how bad that was, even at the time. That first interception was not on Jalen Hurts. Okay. You got to, to see that. Fine. Go to the Giants game. Those interceptions were on him. Listen, man, it's it's still it's still an open argument. Uh, the book is not closed on who is QB4 yet, but we both know that Tua is not the answer. And you can admit that as well. Let's get on to the show. I can't wait to slay into this guy. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Sorry, I put myself on mute for a second. But no, <laughs> um, the one thing I just realized, too, is the last two times a Big Rat was on here, both of the times was when the Dolphins beat the Jets. So I feel like <laughs> if every time you come on here, it's when the Dolphins beat the Jets. Unfortunately, look, we're watching football right now because obviously the schedule got mixed up. We can talk about that with COVID and everything. But look, we're watching football on a Tuesday night, too, so I don't know how it gets better than that. Oh, yeah. We have a game basically every day. There's no games tomorrow, obviously, but we got Thursday. We've got a dual doubleheader on Christmas, and then we've got a full slate on Sunday, and then obviously Big Rad's Dolphins back at it on Monday night. So these next few days, it's going to be a lot of football to watch it. I'm not complaining. A lot of gambling, man. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, that's the main thing, yeah. Uh, fantasy, DFS, the spreads. Like You really feel the impact of that influence on football during these games. Even as even as, so far as like the – the Bears not having to kick the extra point last night, which would have covered the spread. Oh, my God. Oh, that would have been a terrible backdoor for so many people. Th- that was the problem. There has been two near greasy backdoors this year. One of, that was one of them. The other one was the Colts and the Jets. Oh, my God. Yeah. Gary Gilbert. What happened? Uh, 45-yard pass to, to McLaurin. Oh, damn. Oh, damn. Maybe a little longer than that. Shit, I thought like I thought like when I said that I was like I thought like when you said that I thought you were agreeing with me when I said the whole what I fuck I already forgot what I just said. The Colts, Jags, or the I do have just for everyone who knows. Just for everyone uh, tuning in, I currently have an Antonio Gibson two touchdown ticket, uh, and he already has one, and we are on the seven yard line. So let's cash this. You know what? That's what we like to see. Because I know Danny's profited a lot from football this year. I have. I, I don't know what my total record is in all the betting videos that I've posted, but I know that I have not profited once. The closest I've come was Thanksgiving. Um, the Bills, uh, I took the Bills Saints over thinking that it was going to be a shoot, not realizing how bad Trevor Simeon was. And then the Bills Bucks game where I thought the I had the Bills on the money line, which I already had given up on. And then they brought me back in. The video that I so famously went to the stadium in Buffalo to film in the pouring rain uh, to about a week and a half ago. Yeah, I'm feeling for you, Griff. You're going to hit before the season ends. Oh, I better fucking – I better hope so. And, um, well, oh, Seattle just uh, – Matt Stafford just threw a pick. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, Jared, why is Jared Patterson in? Get him the hell out of here. Oh, that would be hilarious. Oh, Get my God. Get him the would, hell out of here. That would be absolutely fantastic if that's how Danny doesn't cash his ticket. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Third and goal. <laughs> Not going to lie, I need to see it. I need, I need to see a Jared Patterson, like, six yep, touchdown. Yeah, Patterson staying in. Yeah. Where the hell is Gibson, man? Come on. Dude, this is, like, the same thing, too, because this happens so much in fantasy. Is like, I think it's happened in Minnesota. It's happened with a few other teams. Patterson. Like, yeah. who is this? Pa- like, I didn't even know Patterson was a guy. I thought it was – I thought uh, – who's, who's their other running back? McKinnon? McKissick. <laughs> McKissick. McKissick. Yeah, McKissick, excuse out, me. Oh, okay, okay. I haven't been paying too, too much attention on who's out for them. I just know that – Fourth and goal, because you had fucking Patterson in. Hey, you're ahead of me. Don't don't spoil it too much. 
Yeah, same. I'm only I, I just switched to that game quickly, and I'm only on third and goal. Um, the only other complaint I'd have about tonight's game is I don't know why they started them both at seven. I would have done like one at seven and one at like eight thirty, you know, to like break it up a bit. Absolutely. Let's see this. Oh, I, I, I Danny, I'm clearly way behind you. I just slipped through Humphrey's arms. I got no, no, I didn't make that catch. Mm. And nothing mm. lead though. Yeah, but um, I just want to move. I just want to get on to week 16 here. Look, we have a lot of games to be played. And it starts with Thursday night, which the last Thursday night game of the year, uh, a pretty intriguing matchup, if you ask me, of Tennessee and San Francisco playing each other. Um, 44 and a half is the over-under, and the spread right now is at San Francisco, three and a half points. Uh, where are we leaning towards this one, boys? Oh, definitely 49ers. I mean, I know Antonio Brown should be back. or uh, I'm sorry, AJ, AJ Brown, Brown should be back. Um, we'll see how he looks. Julio's been a complete bust for them. Didn't he just go back on IR as well or no? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so he's been a, a complete bust for them. Um, yeah, man, uh, the, the Titans stock is uh, rapidly, you know, declining. So if they, you know, sneak into the playoffs or not sneak in, if they win the division, which isn't, is it closed yet or no? Did they clinch? No, 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 no. no. They can't. No, okay. So I, I don't even think they win the division. I definitely think they drop this game and then they, uh, they play the Dolphins, which you know they 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 could lose that game as well. So yeah, uh, yeah. The Titans, uh, in their current version, it's important to remember that Derrick Henry is supposed to come back by the playoffs. So like that should be said. But in their current version, don't they kind of feel like last year's Steelers a little bit? A team that got off to like a big lead, started losing games. The offense looked bad. The quarterback looked bad. They started fading and fading and fading. And then they just, you know, were a quick first round exit in an upset. And that was that. Uh, they kind of give off that vibe right now in terms of like they just keep losing. It just keeps getting worse. I would also say if you're going to bet, like you have to bet on San Fran just because you need the Titans to show you, show it. You need the Titans to prove you wrong. But, you know, would it surprise me if like A.J. Brown, like a Paul Kuharski, who writes for the writes for the Titans. He has his own website, longtime Titans blog beat writer for years. He said that he thinks no A.J. Brown has actually been more important than no Derrick Henry because Deonta Foreman, like for those who have him in fantasy, has been running pretty well lately. Um, some of their other backs have been as well. Like their receivers are just so like the receivers just can't get open. And so that's where really like not having A.J. The drop off between A.J. Brown and Westbrook Akine and all these other guys like is just pretty sizable. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if they bounce back, because let's remember, this is the team that beat the Rams, that beat the Saints. You know, that they won those three straight games without Derrick Henry, where they were like tough, they were hard to beat, they were resilient, they were winning with their defense. Like that team that we saw against the Rams on Sunday Night Football is still in them. So with A.J. Brown back, it wouldn't surprise me if they bounce back, like maybe get a couple of Jimmy G turnovers. But I do think that if you have to bet, you got to make them show it first because they haven't shown it in like a month now. So make them show it uh, before you're willing to place your money with them is what I would say. That that's a very fair analysis. My only sub argument to them is though, if you look at their losses, like remember week one, they got their asses kicked by the Cardinals, then they lost to the Jets, I believe. Danny, you can answer this one. Did that game go to overtime? Yeah. No. Wait, which game? Oh, the Jet Titans Jets. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then, like for example, they lost to Houston, uh, New England. They literally tur- like they probably could have beaten the Patriots or hung in tough with the Patriots, but then they turned the ball over four times. So, like. I agree with you in the sense, though, Big Rat, where they'll be that team that they have they have their moments where it's like, hey, they look good, but when they look bad is when they look bad. So I can see them, yeah, they'll probably make the playoffs. Also, because I don't, I had to show, I had to look this up while you were talking. The dip in the AFC South is hilarious between second and third. So it's nine and five, eight and six, and then three and eleven and two and twelve. So it's just <laughs> like the top two to the bottom two is like a complete one eighty. It's hilarious. But I, I'm honestly with you guys. If I have to uh, bet this game, which I probably will end up doing, you, you got to go San Francisco at three and a half. I feel like I feel like this could be a four point game or a touchdown game or even to a game where San Francisco truly like shows the NFL world that, hey, they're back to being that team we saw two years ago. Now, I'm not saying they're going to make it to the Super Bowl, but I'm saying that they're a team that you get them in the playoffs. It's not going to be an easy out. Yeah, it's going to be like an annoying game. It's like, oh, damn, like, you know, like very close, like going to the last drive. Like no one wants to deal with that. Uh, Like what we got last year with Cleveland against Kansas City. Yeah, very, very, very similar comparison. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're a a Colts fan, I mean, here's how they do it. They Titans lose to the Niners, which, you know, obviously all of us can see that would probably predict that they lose to the Dolphins, which is very possible. 
and they uh, the Colts went out. And the Colts, I believe, this week they get the Cardinals, which is, you know, a tougher one. But the Cardinals, the, you know, the the annual Cliff Kingsbury December fade, it seems to, seems to start rolling in a little bit. And if, if they beat the Cardinals, then they just have the Raiders and the Jaguars. So if the Titans lose Thursday and the Titans lose to the Dolphins, the Colts could still very much steal this division. Now I can see it. I know it, it annoys me and it pains me to say because obviously the Colts just ran a muck on the Patriots on Saturday night. But I honestly... The Colts, it's still very much in their hands. I thought they had to split with Tennessee to win the division, but I feel like now, look, hey, anything's possible. And considering, too, even no matter what happens with that Miami game this coming week, that Miami-Tennessee game next week, that is going to say a lot, I think, about what both teams are going to be for the rest of this year and going into the playoffs and even, to going into 2022. Yep. And, and then I, Real quick, a, a quick take about the Colts, right, and, and, and the MVP award. You know, are the Col- are the Colts where they are without Jonathan Taylor? Because Carson uh, Wentz has been awful, like completely awful. I wouldn't I'm say, say no. I wouldn't he's say been, I, I, he's, I, been, he's been below average. Like he he hasn't been he hasn't been that significant in these games that Taylor has blown up in, like the Patriots game and the Bills game. That's fair, but I don't think he's like been generally awful. I but yeah, fine. Like if you want to say average, below average, whatever. No, they wouldn't be there without Taylor. No. So, so if we define the award to, to most valuable player and they win the division, you know, who knows what seed they would get. He's got to be up there in conversation, like 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 a legitimate, you know, candidate right there. Because Tom Brady's going to struggle without without uh, his weapons now, you know, so he's going to drop stock. Aaron Rodgers is balling. But who else would you really give it to? No, uh, yeah, I think it's it's probably I think only Rogers, Taylor, and Brady would have a shot at this point. I think everyone else is out. I think Dak, I think Dak, this could have really been the year that Dak won MVP. Um, but he's just been so mediocre the last month that like I I even though they're winning a lot of games, I just don't think he's doing enough. And I don't think people will forgive Mahomes for how bad he looked for most of the season. So yeah, and like Lamar. Lamar's missed two games and started throwing a bunch of interceptions against the Browns. Uh, and the Dolphins' performance wasn't good. Kyler missed three games, and now the Cardinals are losing. So, yeah, I think I think those are really the only three who have a chance. I fully agree. My only thing is I feel like they'll end up giving it to Brady or Rodgers, and then they'll give Taylor Offensive Player, offensive of, the year. player of the Year. Yeah. I, feel like that's, I feel like that's just what the writers are going to do if they want to be lazy. But I'll say this. If these next three games, Taylor absolutely continues the ball out against – the Cardinals, the Raiders, and the Jags, which is very possible. All three teams, look, the, 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 I'm just going to say this. The Cardinals will see what their defense does, but then the Raiders' run defense can be very suspect at times, and then Jacksonville's Jacksonville. So if Taylor is wins them those games, I think there's a really strong argument for him winning MVP. Yeah. yeah. Man. And now yeah. Uh, Antonio Gibson is questionable to return with a toe injury, so this is great. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Bad luck, Danny. Um, also, before we, because obviously we'll talk about the, Car- the Colts in a little bit, but Carson Wentz this year, he's thrown for, he's just over 3,000 yards thrown. He's 23 and six, the touchdown interception, and he's got a 95.3 QBR. So it's not the worst stats in the world, but it's not like anything horrible. Like, yeah, he's like, a, I'd say probably mid, middle of the pack, maybe in that, if, if I had to rank all 32 starters right now, probably between 14 to 19, maybe somewhere in there. And if you're the Colts with this offensive line, this running game, and the defense is playing well, even though I think the defense, the way they play, like they give up a lot of stuff underneath. And it's the kind of team that like is susceptible to getting come back on, as we saw with the Bucs, as we saw with the Ravens, which makes sense. I mean, when you play like that, like that too deep zone, like you're pretty much allowing teams to just drive down the middle of the field over and over and over again. Uh, but I, I think the point is, like, with a good defense, with good backs and that O-line, you know, he doesn't need to be the fifth-best quarterback in the league. If he's 14th, 15th, like, that's that, that's fine. Exactly. And, um, well, obviously, since we've been talking about the Colts so much, obviously they're the second game on Christmas. But I feel like, you know what, since we've been talking about them so much, why don't we talk about that game first? Because, obviously, there's the two games on Christmas. Last year we had the one game on Christmas with the Saints and the Vikings, the obviously the infamous Alpha Camara game. But with this game right here, very intriguing, um, an over and under of 49 and a half. And the Cardinals are the surprise favorites at uh, minus one. I'm only saying that because obviously, look, I think a lot of people are expecting that bounce back after what happened against Detroit last week. But at the same time, too, 
I feel like if the Colts basically just have to play mistake-free football, they're fine. Obviously, I knew like Carson threw that one interception to Devin McCourty. Excuse, excuse me, but um, for the most part on Saturday, the Colts barely did anything that was like worthy of like a mistake. Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, the Patriots almost had that though, man. They really did. It was closer than people think, but uh, that was a fair, very, very, very bad first half. So it was just too much to overcome. Can I say something quickly? I'm just going to say this because I know I got some flack on Twitter for it. I would have been more pissed off if the Patriots, say if they had gone for it on that fourth down where they kicked the field goal, say if they got the touchdown, they were up on that drive, and then Taylor got that hole and won. That's what won them the game. I would have been more pissed off at that rather than what happened on Saturday when you had the whole, you know, they were down by, uh, it was 20 to 17, and then he got the hole to kind of put the game on ice. Because at that point, I was just like, you know, when you basically have that tough pill to swallow loss, that's what that was more than anything. Yeah, that's a good one to describe it. Yeah. Uh, so, and, so, and I mean, look, I mean, just just because you I mean, even though Danny and I both will probably pro- I know we're getting to them, but like we'll, we'll both probably predict that you'll lose to the Bills. I mean, it's not like it's not like that loss proves they're frauds. Like the Colts are really good. They showed a lot of toughness. The game was in Indianapolis. Like, you know, it's just one of those you, you lost to a good team. Like it is what it is. It doesn't have to mean anything deeper than that. You know, exactly, exactly. And also, too, the, like the Patriots had to lose at some point as well. Like I knew I knew they weren't going to run the table and win 11 games to end the regular season. Listen, anytime I can poke a little fun at the Patriots, I'm taking the opportunity, you know, just just because I know how those Boston uh, people like to chirp over there and like we, to uh, like to make comparisons and like to, uh, well, you know, hype their teams up. I, I definitely get annoyed. I, I mean, everyone knows I'm a closet Patriots fan, uh, but I. I get annoyed at the at the Max stuff a little bit because I think he and Tua are having a very similar season. Like their 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 passer ratings are nearly identical on the season. It's like ninety five point six to ninety five point three in all the advanced metrics. They're like right next to each other in QBR and EPA per play and all that stuff. They're having very similar seasons, and one is loved and the other one is constantly mocked, and it just kind of drives me crazy because um, I think they're and I think physically they're like similar players. Like they're both they're both. Not super mobile, although Tua is way more mobile than Mac is. And they don't have strong arms. They're supposed to win with the neck up. They're supposed to win by, like, seeing the field and being very mentally advanced. Like, I just don't – they're very similar players. I don't get why one is so loved and the other one is so mocked all the time. But, other, I mean, other than that, I got nothing against the Patriots, though. Um, the only other thing I'm going to say about that is, as I looked up their QBRs, literally, you're right. Tua is a 94.3, Max a 94.6. I think the only thing is because of that is because I think Tua had all this hype, you know, coming out of school and yeah. everything, and that he was like a top five pick. And, and Mac was mocked that. coming out. Yeah. And Mac, you know, there was a lot of question marks. Hell, I questioned him. I even said, too, that his ceiling was um, what Kirk Cousins was in Washington. Now, it yeah. may be that, but he's my quarterback, so I'm going to hope for the best for him. By the way, the only time Big Rat will use QBR in his favor is this argument. Listen, listen. I use all the metrics. Use EPA per play. Use adjusted net yards per attempt. Use PFF grades. Like, they're all the same. They're all it, the same. Every single time I hear he says the same thing, DVOA, all these different me- advanced yes. metrics, Big Rat always brings them out of his bag of tricks every uh, and also, time he comes on here. And also, like, my, my main criticism for QBR when you used it with Hertz is that QBR usually unfairly rewards rushing value. Like Tyrod Taylor in 2015 was like top five in QBR, even though we all know he wasn't a top five quarterback. Um, but Tua and Mac are not winning that way. So I think it's it's different when you use it on them than when you use it on Tyrod, Hurts, Taysom Hill, you know, all these guys. No, ex- no exactly. That's the, th- that's the thing. I feel like everyone just wants to like place like certain – pressures on quarterbacks and it's always a game of like oh he's doing this that's why i hate like oh like don't even like holding out oh you could have had justin herbert at the time but then i don't think there was was i don't obviously i don't know too too much into what the miami dolphins world was but were there dolphins fans back in 2020 that did want herbert or were you guys all dead set on Tua? because it seemed like that from like september of 2019 that you guys Tua, wanted to be tank for Tua. it was the yeah, yeah i mean I don't want to say there was no one, but it was it was definitely the minority. And I think more importantly, even though the Dolphins get all the heat for it, in general, the draft community had two above Herbert. Almost every website did. There was like one or two exceptions. The vast majority of websites had Burrow 1, Tua 2, Herbert 3. Almost all of them. There were some websites. I will go as far as to say there was almost as many websites that had Herbert 4 as there were that had Herbert 2. And almost no one had him 1. No one. So like... The Dolphins get the heat for it, but 
Like, I mean, er everyone was wrong on Herbert, which is fine. Like, that's why I think myself and a lot of other Dolphin fans, it's like, you know, it, how stupid would it be as a Rams fan to say, oh, we should have taken Dak Prescott over Jared Goff? It's like, well, no one was fucking saying that at the time. And I understand that the difference is closer because two and Herbert both won in the top six and Dak won in the fourth round. But it's a difference in degree. It's not a difference in kind. Like, it's the same process. It's like they took the quarterback that you as a fan thought was better at the time, so you can't kill the team for it. And that's that's kind of how most of us view it, you know? It's, so there's no regrets. Exactly. And I want to add on something, too. It's like the people now who look – because obviously I've talked about this draft many times about how bad 2013 was. But the people know as Travis Kelsey came out in that class, and I was like, oh, why wasn't he a top 10 pick and everything? And it's just yes. like – because nobody knew it. Well, also, too, because tight ends take a long time to develop. It's yeah. like even Gronk. Gronk was a second round pick. Like all these yeah. like top end players. I actually record uh, my last episode. I recorded with my fantasy expert Andy McNamara. We were talking about this about how look at all the running backs right now who are dominating the league. None of them are first round picks. All the first round pick guys are not doing so well. Like McCaffrey, Saquon, Ezekiel Elliott, who are all top ten picks. And then you had the all these second third round guys like Alvin Kamara, like Jonathan Taylor. Like um, Kamara Taylor, Dalvin Cook, hell, James Robinson, undrafted. Like, there's just, it's so yeah. hard to predict what these guys are going to be that I feel like everyone who's taken in the first round just has so much pressure to perform on them that when they don't perform, they, they're going to get shit on by the media and their fan base. Yeah. That's a fair way to say it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to this game, guys. Colts, Cardinals. Do we. Do we think the Cardinals are going to bounce back after what happened last Sunday? Probably what I'll call the – which I also just realized something too. Last year, Detroit uh, – last year, Rams were a very top top team in the league, lost to the Jets. Week 15 this year, you have the Cardinals, very top team, losing to the league-worst Lions. Just, just, two, just something I want to point also out. also blow their number one pick. Yeah. 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 But I mean, um, listen, I, man, I, with the Cardinals – <clears throat> I think I think I think Kyler's really trying to figure it out without uh without New Hopkins on there, you know, because he was drawing a lot of uh, attention as far as coverage. Now all you really do, all you really have to do is uh, cover Christian Kirk and uh, uh, watch AJ Green, who's having an okay year, and then uh, you know Zach Ertz is there as well. So I think it's a little tougher on Kyler right now, and I think he's got to figure that out. And the defense, I don't know that they just didn't show up to the field on Sunday. So you know the the defense is better than that. I will give them credit. Um, I think the defense will show up this week, but um, you know I just think the Colts are the better team right now, despite the records. The Colts are they're red hot. I came on here a few weeks ago and I hyped the Colts up. So I think they're just going to keep rolling. The fact too that they're at plus money from a gambling yeah. perspective, I think for now, just, for now though. But so if you can, if you want to grab, like if that line does not change. You run with the Colts at plus money. Absolutely, um, I, I will probably include them in my uh, in my five. I, I think before we started recording, I was telling them yes. that I sent five picks to my brothers every week, uh, forty two and thirty two on the year, so decently profitable. Five and a week last week, and uh, I, I'm going to pick the Colts um, as well. I do think they're playing better, and I will say, like one of the rules I told you guys before the show was that early in the year I stopped taking the Dolphins because this was when they were playing the Bucks. And the Jaguars and the Falcons, and they were just, they were implode. They, they didn't look like the, the Brian Flores team that I knew. They look more like that right now. Um, so I, I, had, I had to make a rule to stop taking them. One of the other rules I made was to stop fading Cliff Kingsbury because I would bet against the Cardinals every week. And like both, especially both those games that, uh, that Colt McCoy played against the Niners and the Seahawks. If people forget, but like the, the Cardinals were only like short underdogs in both of those games for most of the week. Because most people didn't realize that Colt McCoy was going to start. And I remember telling my brother, like, yo, jump on this, jump on this. The Seahawks are only plus two. The Niners are only plus two. Like, people don't know that Colt McCoy is going to play. And then the game comes, and by kickoff, the Niners and the Seahawks, respectively, were, like, seven-point favorites in both those games. And the Cardinals won outright twice. Uh, so the, the Cardinals have burned me a lot on betting this year. I will say, I will say. There is a trend with Cliff Kingsbury. This happened last year that the t and this was true at Texas Tech too. That the team usually gets worse over the course of the season. And apparently, according to Michael Silver, Michael Bidwell, the owner of the Cardinals, the reason Cliff was on the hot seat wasn't just because they went eight and eight last year. It was because they started out so strong and then they crumbled down the stretch. Now we could just blame that on Kyler's shoulder injury. That's fine. But I do think that um, you know they lost to the 
Losing to the Rams was one thing. Losing to the Lions in the manner that they did, they got destroyed. I mean, it does make you wonder, is this the snowball that's going down the hill and it's just going to get worse from here? Because I do think the Rams are the better team, and I think it would be more fitting if the Rams won that division. Um, So uh, similar to the Titans, I'm going to predict the Colts, and I need the Cardinals to prove me wrong. I want to see it. I want to see it one more time. Last time I bet against Arizona in the regular season. If they win this game, I'll stop doing it the last two weeks of the season. You, I, I, I got I got like I said before. I'm riding with the Colts. Look, last week, Danny will admit, Danny will, will attest to this too. I was I just didn't buy them. I thought, look, my Patriots were going to go in there. I thought we were going to get the win. Even too when it was plus money for the Pats, I'm like, that's the thing. I feel like too with plus money a lot of the times. I feel like sometimes I do that in close games like this to kind of get you to lure to take it to feel like, hey, because if it gets to be right, the payout's going to be greater. So I, but at the end of the day too, when I think about it logically, because that's like my number one rule of betting is to never overthink things. And I'm just going to stick with it. I'm going to go with the Colts. I'm going to go with Jonathan Taylor because at the end of the day, when it comes down to what offense, and I'm not going to say quarterbacks because I trust Kyler over Carson, but I just think there's a good chance that Jonathan Taylor can burn that can burn uh, Arizona Saturday night. And by the way, um, after after what happened to Michael Pittman, I don't think you're allowed to support him anymore on this podcast. Oh, uh. <laughs> We're still waiting for our Colts Giants primetime game next year. That's that's on the docket. Oh, that bet that bet that better happen. And the other thing I'll say about that is look, Duggar deserved to get ejected from that. I just don't I, I didn't even understand why. They said Pittman started it. I couldn't find an angle, but man, he was he didn't seem mad. He seemed like like you know when you like get your ass kicked you and you're just Fred. sad? He was just like I was just being these I just basically want to be like, buddy, like put a brave face on and also to he took forever to leave the sidelines. I was just like, man, you're just making it worse on yourself. Like I love, like Michael Pittman, love the player, but at the same time too, I was just like, man, Dogger just fucking owned you. That 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 uh that cost me in one of my most important leagues, um, the the Pittman deal, a uh, one point three, and and that league's not full PPR, so one point three points he gave me in the playoffs. It was it was not fun. I, I saw Belichick today said he thought T.Y. Hilton should have gotten ejected. Uh, for 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 a different situation, but yeah, that, that that was rough, rough, rough look for the pits for the Pittston fam uh, for the Pittman family. Very, very, you know, a very very rough, very rough look for uh, for us for us Pittman fans. Because look, at the end of the that's why I tweeted this outside, and I'm like, oh look, like I love Kyle Duggar. He's a great football player, hard hitting guy. But Michael Pittman too, another player. Like we say, YWC Football Talks favorite wide receiver. The two of them going at it. I'm like, oh my god, it's like when you see your children fight. <laughs> yeah Unbelievable. and then yeah but um anyway let's go to the first game on saturday between cleveland and green bay um the, i feel like we're all gonna go uh, green bay to win this game just because i feel like look it's a safe pick we don't know if baker's gonna play yet or not but i have to ask, ask you guys this does green bay cover eight points <sighs> i say no i say i that doesn't mean i'm gonna like, I only send five picks, so I only send, like, my five favorite picks. I don't know if this will be amongst my five favorite. But I think the Browns, I know it was a devastating loss. Like, devastating. Heartbreaking. They should have won that game. Uh, I think they're, I think they're, their playoff lives are kind of on the line here. And uh, I think they're going to put in a good effort. And I think they're going to do what they can. Okay. Danny, uh, the – sorry. I just saw the, I just saw the Dallas Goddard catch. That should offset – the pick that wasn't a Hertz's fault because that's 100% should have been a picked ball and God yeah. took it out of the air. Yep. Uh, in, any event. It, in a playoff game, so I'm not too excited. And uh, I, I will say, but yeah, I, I think the Browns, it's their seasons on the line. I think they're going to put forth one last good effort. I don't think they could do enough to win because winning at Lambeau is just too much to ask for, especially when Rodgers is especially going to be trying to win MVP. Uh, but I do think, I do think that I do think that um, they're going to put forth one last, like, like leave it all out there, emotional, best game of your season, and, like, lose by, like, five points. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just don't think uh, Cleveland has enough, man. I, I You know, like, the the defense the, – Miles Garrett got hurt, right? Is he, is he playing or no? Or we don't know yet, obviously. But um, I don't know. I, I just think, like Big Rat said, man, Rodgers is going for that MVP. He knows it's there for the taking – uh, you know, they want to 
you know, establish themselves as a true contender, I think they might roll. I, I, I would take them to cover the spread. I'm not going to bet it, but I would. You know what? That's the thing. I feel like with this game, I feel like the safe bet is for the gold Packers money line. But if I had to look at spreads here, look, I'd probably go Cleveland to cover eight points, especially too after what we saw the Ravens do to the uh, Packers on Sunday afternoon. Which I think the spread was very similar. I think it was eight or eight and a half points for Green yeah. Bay. Yeah, that yeah, was no, well, that was an, that was an impressive uh, showing from Huntley right there. Which I think we'll get into in a minute because I actually have a uh, an opinion on that I want to ask you guys in a little bit. But I look at the first three games of Sunday. One of them has Danny's eye. One of them is uh, just egregious, and that is actually before we get to that, guys. I just have to actually shout out a uh, quick sponsor of the show, Sideline Shop. Guys, I talk about it all the time. Uh, no matter the sport, you go on the sideline dot shop, sideline shop dot ca. They have all your jersey needs. Link in the bio. If you do go and shop there, leave in the notes. Tell them the Griff sent you. Because look, you got to pay the bills around here. So just had to shout them out quickly. Sideline shop dot ca. Well, anyway, guys, back to the Sunday slate of games right here. The first one is just completely egregious, and that is the Lions at the Falcons. Like. <laughs> I mean, Goff has COVID, right? I, yeah. I does he, he, Yeah, he was put on the list. Now he could he could test out before Sunday. Uh, but yeah, he's on the list. All right. Well, something I care about. Well, two things I care about. DeAndre Swift, you need to play, man. Come on. We're in the fantasy championship now. So and uh two, I need the Lions to win this game because I need uh a draft pick. So that's <laughs> the only two things I care about. Other than that, couldn't care less. Like, I have the same opinion. I'm just like, I, I have no dog in the fight. I'm just, I'm looking at this game like this is a game. Look, do not bet at any cost. If you are, maybe, I want to say under 44, but I could see people thinking that and going that route. So over 44 is also not crazy considering both defenses are really not ideal. And then the Falcons defense is just horrible. But if golf doesn't play, I think I have to go Falcons. I mean, hopefully Kyle Pitt shows up uh, and has a dominant game for once because we've been waiting for it all year. The Fal- this, this Falcons team, like, they have a horrible point differential, like one of the five worst in the league. They're like 31st in overall DVOA, like overall, not just offense or defense. Like, according to DVOA, this is a worse team than, like, the Texans. Like, they, if they win this game, they got to be the worst 7-8 and eight team I've ever seen in my life. Uh but it is the Lions. I think I think if Goff comes back, I don't know. I think the Lions have found a little magic these last couple of weeks. You know, when they lost to Denver, that was after the Demarius Thomas thing. Like, that was obviously an incredibly emotional game. Uh, I think if the Lions get Goff back, I think they can upset them here. Um, but obviously, without, without Goff, I mean, Tim Boyle's got no chance. So, Falcons then. But do we like the Lions at plus four? Uh, with Goff, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. With with Tim Boyle, I think it's risky because Tim Boyle's likely to like he could just like have like a bunch of bad turnovers. So like yeah, I would say you need Goff in there to take it. But if Goff is in there, then take it for sure. Yeah, and I'm gonna say too, this Seattle LA game is a lot closer than I thought it was gonna be. The Seahawks are tough, man. Like they're 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 not that great, but like they they know like they're it's kind of like the Browns thing, you know, season on the line. Their season's on the line every week. So Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, if they lose out, I don't think Danny's going to be too mad. No. <laughs> Just get me a top 10 pick, man. They, they still play the Cardinals week seven, week 18, too. They don't have, like, a super clean schedule here. I think they lose one. If they lose this game, I think they lose one either to the Bears or to the Lions, man. I really do. It's more wishful thinking than anything, but I think it's it's more possible than people think. Hey, they lost, the, they lost to uh, the Giants with uh, Colt McCoy last year, so... Very fair statement. But anyway, back to this game. Uh, I'm I'm going to go Falcons just because, look, I think with Goff's status uncertain, I think it's just it's a safe pick. So I'm just going to I'm going to say that. And I would go even if Goff doesn't play, if this line were at plus three, then I would consider going with. Uh, oh, what a catch by Cooper. Oh, Cooper Cup is. Uh, oh, no, he's good. Oh, wait, no, he's hurt. No. Uh, he's walking a little gingerly off the field right now. He just made a really nice catch. He's uh, oh, that sucks for them. 
Um, but yeah, no. So I don't think we have anything else left to say. Uh, Giants at Eagles, which man, the opening line spread is at minus ten for this game. Now I know it's Mike Glennon starting, but the Giants did beat them I think last Brom time. Is starting. What, from yeah, Brom? Uh, well, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it was confirmed or not, but um, uh, uh, I don't know if that was confirmed or not, but uh, yeah, they did, they did bench him for From in the Cowboys game, and the in, in, in indications were that he was going to get the job now. So, do you want to? Can I read out Mike Glennon's yards, touchdowns, interception as QBR on the year? Oh God, yes. <laughs> Six, so he's sixty nine for one twenty nine. He's thrown for 673 yards, three touchdowns, seven picks, and a QBR of 53.5. Now read how much money he's stolen over his career. Oh, I know. I remember that that dumb Chicago Bears contract in 2017. Jeez. Uh, yeah, and I, I will say he did play the Dolphins and the Cowboys. You know, that's not the that's not the most favorable string of games to be playing uh defenses to be playing as a backup quarterback uh but yeah he's uh he's a thief there's uh there's no other way around it and And it just goes it just goes to show you like instead of like as your backup quarterback instead of getting like one of these like failed former second round picks or something like why don't you get someone new like do what the ravens did go get go find a tyler huntley don't just like recycle these bad quarterbacks who you have no shot of winning with over and over and over again he Fair, says this as Matt Schaub is one of his all-time favorite quarterbacks. Hey, Matt Schaub is a starter, all right? Not Matt Schaub is a backup. Matt Schaub should not have been a backup quarterback. I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, he, was a backup in, he was a backup in Atlanta for, like, uh, well, for at least five years, no? Oh, yeah, yeah, because he was a backup in Baltimore in 2015. Um, I, I'll never forget that because the Dolphins, the Dolphins' defense that year was horrible, like terrible. And they played, they played the Ravens with Matt Schaub at quarterback in 2015 because Flacco was out for the year. And I started them in fantasy, and I told my brother, they're not only going to play well in fantasy, they're going to – specifically, they're going to have a pick six. And sure enough, they they got a pick six on Matt Schaub. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, um, he, he was in Atlanta for like five years. Yeah, but the thing I'll say about the Giants is, though, hey, look, their fans enjoyed that media – so for fan appreciation, they gave out a free medium, medium soda. soda? <laughs> but it was only one per account. A medium. They, like, it's one thing to not give the souvenir cups. They couldn't even give a large. A medium soda. Unbelievable, man. The biggest scam going in sports, man. And you know, their season tickets cost a lot, bro. And they yeah, haven't that- been worth it since, you know, that Super Bowl team. I mean, yeah, they did make the playoffs in between there, I think, once. But... Other than yeah. that, man, you know, they're just people have just been yeah, that, overpaying for those tickets. That, that's Giants a, don't want to, can I, that's sorry, a, Big Rack. Can I say oh, yeah, something I quickly? That, that, that's a very high price clientele. Like, like you really can't give them a free souvenir cup. You can't give them a free large. They they're spending a lot of they might be spending more on season tickets than any other fan base in the league. The only other thing I was gonna say was um and Giants fans are gonna want to punch me in the face with this. Dude, they've been horrible since that the boat photo. I feel like this offseason, a bunch of them have to go recreate that picture on the boat, and maybe they'll start winning again. <laughs> they, I believe they and the Jets, sorry to pick on you, Danny, I think they've been the two teams with the worst record over the last uh, five years, I think, or something like that, five oh, or four really years. Jets. Absolutely the Jets. Yeah, but, like, the Jets, though, because, like, Danny said this before, like, going into the year, the Jets knew they were going to have a bad season, the Giants, I think, look, there's all this ex- expectations from the do well, all this stuff here and there. And look, right now, like I even messaged Danny this the other day. Like, look, the Giants, I think I know there's all those rumors about them wanting to bring in someone for Joe Judge. I, I feel like you got a clean house completely in New York. Like, is that fair? Oh, and, uh, is that for fair? the Giants, for Big Blue. Yeah, well, Giants. we all know Gettleman's gone for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm. It's complicated because if you fire Gettleman, like you kind of have to fire Joe Judge because it's going to be hard to get a GM and force them to take to accept Joe Judge for one year. You kind of want to do a clean sweep. Um, so that's what makes it kind of awkward. Uh, like cause a, a new GM and Joe Judge, Joe Judge is just going to get fired within a year unless you specifically have Joe Judge pick the GM. And then have them work in tandem for several years, but then you like you have no wiggle room to fire Joe Judge. Then like you have to keep him for a long time, and you don't know if you want to do that. So 
it, it's a really tricky situation. This is what the Dol- this It's the kind of shit the Dolphins always get themselves in trouble with, where they fire just the head coach and not the GM, and they kind of don't know what to do because it's like not fair to fire Judge yet. Like it's 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 just an annoying dilemma they put themselves in. But the Gettleman's had more than enough time. Should be said. Should be said that trade down. Uh, that trade down in the first round of the draft. They took right. Kadari. They took Kadarius Tony. Everyone mocked them for it, and he's been pretty good when he's been healthy. He's barely played, but Two when he's games. been healthy. Yeah, you, dude. He had a two hundred yard game. Like that. That's worth respect. My guy hasn't done that yet. Neither is your. Neither is your guy. So, he he's looked good. Just eye test wise, he's looked good when he's played. And they got the Bears pick, and the Bears pick profiles to be like top five. Yeah, yeah. that's the, that's the one good thing they do have going for them. But um, yeah, man, no, that doesn't work. We did that with the Rex Ryan when we uh we fired Tannenbaum, we kept Rex, and we hired uh John Idzik, which was probably yeah. the worst GM in all of NFL history. But, um, yeah, it's just a recipe for disaster, man. And, you know, they, they have parallels to uh, Sam Darnold, too, with Daniel Jones, not knowing if he's going to be the guy going into year three. So, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a mess. Uh, they have no cap as well. So, it's, you know, you have, the, you have the call on Saquon. If they pay him, that would be the massive mistake, I feel. But, um, uh, yeah, man, not, not, uh, not looking good for Big Blue. Uh, I got to look this up right now. So the Giants are 27th in the league for cap. Uh, do you, I, uh, so there's a tweet from, shout out for, uh, from Pro Football Focus, uh, former guest of the show, Austin Gale. Over 50% of the Giants' 2022 cap is currently slated to go to Leonard Williams, James Bradbury, Kenny Galladay, Adoree Jackson, Blake Martinez, and Sterling Shepard. Garbage. Yeah, it's 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 kind of sad, like, with the Saquon contract, like, like, he's already – I've already saw someone say, like, you know, like, they need to get rid of that contract, but it's hard to because who's going to trade, like, a good pick for Saquon at this stage of his career? And it's like, the dude's only in his fourth year in the league, and he's already – he's all like, he's already viewed like how Zeke is viewed now, how Todd Gurley was viewed, how Lev Bell was viewed. Like, he's already viewed as this second contract running back overpaid, and he's only a rookie. And he's only on his rookie deal still. It's just – it's crazy how quickly, like – how quickly we're ready to move on from these guys. It's just, you can't, you can't pay guys like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah. as, as far as the second contract, you know, you, you find these running backs out of, out of, out of nowhere, man. Look what, look what, look what Duke Johnson did, you know? Look Hell yeah, man. Random, these random guys just, you know, off the street can just come in and just have crazy games. Unless you're a Jonathan Taylor or a Derrick Henry, which, and that's pretty much it. You, you really, you're, you're replaceable. Unfortunately, Zeke, like Zeke, said, listen, Tony Pollard is outplaying Zeke this year, in my opinion. He is. You, he is. You know, Tony, yeah. Tony, you know, Tony Pollard's only making nine hundred and sixty k this year. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I mean, and like, how about how about even Danny's boy, who I like, Michael Carter? It's like that was a fourth round pick. They're paying him freaking nothing, and he's outproducing a lot of guys. Yeah, love Michael Carter. Yeah, um, I, I, obviously it's Tuesday, and I'm recording this, but I was talking about this on my fantasy podcast that earlier today. And the and my buddy Andy was saying, who's a big fantasy expert, uh, look, for next year, look at M- Michael Carter and Elijah Moore for fantasy. Oh, Elijah Moore is a stud. Absolute stud. Bigger I can admit that. Second I round, I, too. He's, he's a great player because uh, there's, there's a lot of tension amongst Dolphin fans because there's a lot of Dolphin fans that thought the Dolphins could have just, like, traded back and taken him or taken Tony, um, which is hilarious now. People hated Tony at the time. Uh but so yeah, but I, I won't deny it. He's he's a great player, great 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 player. And we, you know, I, I still want to go. I, I would be happy with a receiver uh, with the Seahawks pick. So you know, we gotta add Corey Davis isn't getting it done for us, unfortunately. So uh, we just gotta keep you know building to that core. But Elijah Moore is definitely a piece. Michael Carter's a piece, and uh, yeah, not not too much after that. So then with this game though, Giants and Eagles, uh, do we go Eagles? But do we go Eagles minus ten, or do we go Giants plus ten? I think it's really hard to pick the Eagles to cover a big spread in any game. Like they're just, just it's it's mainly because of the way they play. It's like it's like picking the Seahawks to cover double digit spread, or like the Ravens, Lamar Jackson's rookie year specifically. Like when you run as often as they do, it like it just shortens the game. You know, there's like it shortens the game. Jalen Hurts is liable to turn it over at any point. Like. Their defense, their defense is notorious for giving up long drives because they allow a super high completion percentage, even though they don't allow big plays. So I just think it's hard to cover ten points, even against Jake Fromm. 
And I don't think Jake Fromm is that much worse than Glennon. He'll probably be either similar or a slight upgrade. So, yeah, let's do I mean, that. Look at, look at the game going on right now with Jared Gilbert. Had, yeah. You know, hasn't even practiced with the team, and they're not even beating them. So, so how about this? Give me I, I, I think it's an untouchable game, but I would lean Giants. How about this? Yeah, Giants, Giants beat them a few weeks ago also. Yeah. Eagles yeah. to win, but Giants to cover. Yeah, that's probably a good parlay. Giants plus 10 with Eagles money line, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. And now we got the Danny Bowl, the game that Danny, the whoever the loses. The important game of the year. Jets at Jets versus Jags. Jets are a minus two favorite, over under at 41 and a half. I know Danny wants Jacksonville to win, but I want to hear Big Rat's opinion on this game. I should say, uh, since we... Uh, this will probably be my only time to talk about the Jets. Uh, obviously, I'll talk about the Dolphins when we get to Monday Night Football. Um, I thought I thought Zach Wilson looked all right last week. Personally, like he embarrassed his his. I think Danny. I don't know how often you've seen it this year, but like it seemed to me at least watching the Jets game for a first time with him, like his scramble ability, like that that Mahomes like. Obviously, he's not the Mahomes comparisons are you know crazy. Obviously, but like that Mahomes trait of being able to scramble and make a play on the run. Or even just scramble and, like, get a first down with your legs. Like, you really saw that in that Dolphins game. And he wasn't missing layups as often as he was in the other games that I've seen. Uh, I thought he looked okay. And so uh, that gives you some hope because New York media has been brutal. Danny's kind of going through what I went with Tua last year. Although it's the New York media, so it's probably worse. I don't read it all like you do. But it's probably worse just because it's the New York media. And uh, I think he's been as bad as Trevor. I think Trevor Lawrence has been as bad, if not worse. Trevor Lawrence doesn't get any heat because it's Jacksonville. Everyone hates Urban Meyer and everyone's just going to blame Urban Meyer and their injuries. But if you look at their numbers, they're pretty comparable. And I would argue Zach Wilson has been a little bit better uh, because at least at least the Jets can occasionally score like they scored 18 against the Eagles. They scored 17 against the Dolphins. Um, 24 if you count the pick six from Tua. But the Jaguars have so many games where they don't score more than seven points. Like, they have so many games where they just can't do anything. And I think the Zach Wilson has shown a little bit more than Trevor has. So I will give you that as a credit. Um, in regards to this game, uh, I, you're, you might like – I guess you'll like this as a Jets fan. I think I, I kind of have a weird feeling about Jacksonville winning this game. Uh, not just because, you know, James Robinson could destroy that rush defense now that they're using him like they're supposed to. But I think last week the line the line moved like three points when Urban got fired. And that seemed like a little bit of an overreaction. Like I fully believe in the head coach bump. Like the, Ra- the, the game everyone talks about is the Raiders with Rich Bisaccia. They beat the Broncos after Gruden resigned. So a lot of people thought the same thing was going to happen against the Texans. The Jaguars would like, you know, in the first game without Urban, they'd explode and they beat them up. Um the line, I think, overcorrected. I do think that kind of performance is still in them, where they kind of like win out of nowhere and surprise everybody, even despite not having their head coach. And uh, I have a weird feeling that I think that they get one more win, and this is their last win of the year, is winning this game. And uh, the Jets, you know, they do their best. I think the Jags D-line can also give the Jets O-line some problems. The Jags D-line is still really good, even though they keep losing every week. They do still get decent D-line pressure. So, yeah, I like uh, I like the I like the Jaguars here, and Danny gets his first his first overall pick, just like he wants. Yeah, man, Aiden Hutchinson, bro. Yeah, man, um, definitely definitely the biggest game of the year. Um, in terms of you know we blew this last year, we constantly blow this. We blew it for Nick Bosa, we blew it for Trevor Lawrence. Um, but yeah, honestly, as far as the game goes, James Robinson's gonna have probably a career day. Uh, I would take him for two touchdowns uh, if you're betting. But um, I think that's going to open up stuff for Trevor. I think Trevor's going to be able to move the ball. Um, as long as Zach looks good, you know, and he's not, you know, having awful turnovers and the defense is what's uh, causing us to lose, I wouldn't mind. You know what I mean? But if, if it's Zach coming out and, you know, turnover here, t- turnover there, not the offense isn't moving the ball, it will be concerning because, you know, Jacksonville fans and Jet fans go at it a lot on Twitter about whose team yeah. is – is worse, you know, which is pretty embarrassing because you know we both <laughs> suck, we absolutely suck. You know, no one's a no one's a winner here. But um, yeah, man, no, uh, Zach's definitely been progressing though. I know uh, it's not at a rate that the New York media, like Big Red said, wants it to be at. 
but um, he's starting to hit his layups. You know, that was by far his best mobility uh, game that I've seen so far this year. But he still took five sacks at the same time. The O-line's been god-awful. Um, and he also, he has no one to throw to, man. He lost Corey Davis. He lost Elijah Moore. Um, you know, Crowder seems checked out because he's, you know, he's walking at the end of the year. You know, Barrios is cool. I like Barrios. And uh, other than that, we have no one. Keelan Cole was a bust of a signing. So it's, it's tough out here for Zach, man. He's not getting open. Uh, he's not getting no one open. Denzel Mims is officially you know, a bust. Very, I was very high on him, but uh, even Big Rat was high on him. I was, yeah. But I am officially calling it he's a bust. Um, so, yeah, man. Uh, I could see it going over, though. I could see this game going over. And, yeah, let's just hope for a loss, man. Get me, uh, get me Aiden Hutchinson. And let's let's see let's see some of that. Cre- I mean, I know Lafleur has kind of had a love hate relationship with Jets fans. I know you guys hated him early in the year, and then in those games without Zach Wilson, like with Josh Johnson, with Joe Flacco against the Dolphins, and with Mike White against the Bengals, like I think you guys would be pretty proud of like you know how well the offense played in those games. Um, and I thought like he was very creative against the Dolphins. He had a lot of cool trick plays. It wasn't just the one that everyone sees on Twitter of Crowder like throwing it backwards for the hook and ladder to Barrios. Oh, that was awesome. Down. That was awesome. Even I, as a Dolphin fan, was like, man, that was fucking cool. <laughs> like, that, no, I, I, thought, I thought he called a good game. I mean, I know the defense, like, overwhelmed them in the second half, but I thought it was mainly just because the O-line, like, had no chance. Like, the Dolphins, the Dolphins figured something out in their blitz scheme, and yep. then just the Dolphins figured something out in blitz scheme, yeah, and took advantage of it. So uh, I would I would argue that, uh, I, I would argue that Lafleur. Hopefully, he keeps up whatever he was dialing up against the Dolphins. You know, even if you lose, like just be creative, be magical, like do do some of that cool stuff you were doing against us. Do it against the Jaguars. You know. Yeah, big credit to Mike Lafleur, man. He was getting killed the first month of the season, man. Maybe the first month and a half, and then you know he's always been a booth coordinator, and he finally went up to the press box, and the offense has been completely different, man. Just like, I guess he just sees the game a lot more clearer up there, and. Uh, you know, the, the the offense has been has been, you know, the scheme has been working out really well. I mean, the execution of the of the town of players isn't there, but you can see what he's trying to do. You know, I'm going to I'm going to come on here to avoid that air. Look, the the Jets are just it's like it's like I said before, I think a lot of I think they're not getting as much flax. I feel like a lot of the media and fans knew exactly what they were going to get. Like, I don't think last year they thought there were two and 14 bad considering Seven and nine the year before. Um, and hey, who was that one reporter that got fired for being a creep? Oh, Manish, Manish Mehta. Mehta. Yeah, Manish. Like, like he's going to. Um, I've been. I've read some of uh, Rich uh, Rich Chimini stuff. Like some Chimini, of his stuff. Chimini, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a good reporter. I know him and Pat Leonard are really taking good looks into each of where the Jets and the Giants sit at this time of the year and look for. It's it's really bleak if you're a Giants fan, but I feel like with the Jets. All you guys want is just you want progress. You want something to hold on to for the future. And then, look, if losing this game means getting Aiden Hutchinson or even maybe Kayvon Thibodeau, we'll, we'll see what happens. But this year's draft, I feel like a lot of people are going to look at as not attractive just for the purposes of there's not that marquee quarterback. Look, this year's going to be a pretty good draft, in my opinion. So whatever happens, happens. But – Look, and as it goes for this game, look, I, I, I think I got to go Jacksonville here, especially two of the plus money, plus two and a half. And Big Rat, as you were saying it earlier, I had my hand up in the air. Why? I'm one of the suckers that fell for Jacksonville minus five against Houston. Hey, hey for the record, I, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to shame you because when I found out he got fired, the line was still three. And I texted my brother, oh, I think we might be taking Jags minus three for the fired head coach bounce back. But it, it it rose all the way up to five and a half at my book. And I was like, holy shit, like, that's a big jump. <laughs> like that, that, That's a really, really big jump. And uh, I think it should be said, it's unconventional, but I don't think it makes it any less true. It should be said that uh, that uh, Davis Mills has uh, probably outplayed Trevor Lawrence this year, I would say. Which is a very bad thing to say, considering everyone was calling Trevor Lawrence like the next John Elway and stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know who's going to coach that team next. I saw. I don't. Did you guys see James Lofton's list on that? No. no. Well, anything oh. interesting? Oh, it was so bad. Uh, I got to look it up. Uh, I, I, I did. Albert Breer did say that he thinks 
that this cycle could have a lot of second chance coaches. Um, Todd Bowles. Todd Bowles, Dan Quinn, uh, like Leslie Frazier from the Bills. Like he thinks that Rex Ryan in Jacksonville, man. Oh God, no! I can't <laughs> deal with Rex anymore. Jesus, um, he's terrible, man. Man, I don't know what people see with the whole Byron Leftwich, Todd Bowles stuff. Like, big, yeah. like Dan. I don't know if Danny and I have talked about this, but Big Raz brought up before how conservative his play calling was with the Jets and everything. So, like, I don't know why people think just because he resurrected the defense in Tampa, why he would be such a good head coach again. Um, I've also seen Leslie Frazier connected to like the Chicago Bears for some reason. Yeah. Um, but I actually I have someone from ESPN that I want to throw out who could be a head coach and if who could be. I'm not saying for next year for Jacksonville, but maybe somewhere down the road. Would there be a chance someone would take a crack at hiring like a Dan Orlovsky? Not as a head coach. I, 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 if he wants it, but I, yeah, I, I, I would think he would need to. He would probably need to be like a coordinator first, like take an OC job somewhere, and then like quickly move his way up. Um, something like that I could see. Uh, but yeah, head coach, I'm not so sure. And and just in general, a lot of the new guys, a lot of the new like hot coordinators, it, it's just not a great year because like Eric Bieniemy, like uh, the Chiefs' offense obviously had all their problems like for a lot a large portion of the season. Even though they seem to kind of be back on track now, um, that does like kind of hurt his stock a little bit. Brian Dable is getting yelled at by Sean McDermott in press conferences, like uh, you know Wink Martindale for the Ravens. Like that Ravens defense has been terrible. Like they get roasted all the time. People are starting to get sick of uh, his all-out blitzes every play. <laughs> so th- th- a lot of those guys that we hear about in past years, they're just not really set up to uh, to repeat that success right now. Exactly, exactly. The one guy I can see, though, that is a current coordinator that, probably could, that could get a head coaching job is maybe Nathaniel Hackett up in, uh, yeah. in yeah, Green Br- Bay. Yeah, Breer Br- 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 has mentioned him too, yeah. That's just that's just something I wanted to point out. But uh, So I think all in all for this game, we're going to all go with Jacksonville. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, v- sure. Vance Joseph. That's another retread. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Vance Joseph was the other one that could get like another second chance option uh, because of how good the Cardinals' defense has been. Having the time of his life. <laughs> um, Carolina versus Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay coming off a bad night. What I will say this: if that w- if there was a proper quarterback in that game's like twenty eight nothing or maybe worse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think it was under. It was. Yeah, like the it should have looked more like the Buck Saints game from last year. Um, it just didn't because the Saints offense just couldn't score. Exactly. I, 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 I with that game too. I hate how people were more or less crediting. Oh, why did Tampa play bad instead of hey, this is what New Orleans did good because that D line for New Orleans had one hell of a game. Oh yeah. They 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 seem to match up well with Tampa Bay's O line because. Uh, the Bucks O-line is, like, the best in the league. Like, Tristan Wirfs had only allowed one pressure all year long. He hasn't even allowed a sack. And for whatever reason, Cam Jordan, Davenport, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because the O-line wins with speed and finesse, and they're all power rushers. But, like, they every time they play, the D-line is getting consistent pressure. And that's a big part of the reason why the Bucks offense kind of short circuits a little bit. You know, You know what? That's... Something I agree with because I feel like a lot of the times too. Oh, that's another name too for head coaches that probably could get. I think may get a crack is uh, Dennis Allen even too. Uh, recycled head coaches. Yeah. Yes. 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 That's another. That's another popular name. And he, he was even before Sunday night. I had heard. I had heard that too. I had heard that for a while, but I always said that Sunday was like an audition chance for him. Uh, even too for the Saints D line, you have to add in like uh, David on Yamada. Shout out yep. uh, Winnipeg. But um, the only thing with Tampa's O line I don't like is. Like, I think Ryan Jensen's a good player. I like Tristan Wirfs. Uh, Alex Kapp was good, too. But, man, Donovan Smith does not get called for, like, half of the holds that he does in every single game. Yep. Uh, he, he's their weak link, and he doesn't really get exposed for it like some of the other guys do. No. And then I, 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 I like I, – like, you guys know me. I love Brady. But the stuff of, like, him throwing a tablet and, like, just sitting Yelling there looking all sad and, like, like, apparently yelling, go fuck yourself at Dennis Allen and stuff, like – if any other quarterback in the league did that, they would be getting absolutely just steamrolled and just obliterated by the media. Oh yeah. No, I mean even I'm like, though, for, man. yeah, even 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 non quarterbacks. Yeah, like I mean, like what he did was way worse than what Cassius Marsh did against the Steelers, and that cost the Bears that game. Like he he walked like Cassius Marsh 
taunted from midfield on Monday Night Football for the Bears against the Steelers. Brady walked all the way to the other sideline. He made sure to get as close as he possibly could before cursing them out. Like, that that was a different level. Yeah, it was just one of those things. It's like I said, look, Brady, he's a good winner, but he's a sore, sore loser. Like, he was never – I never really – I don't know if I didn't pay much too much attention to this when he was in New England, but it's really come out when he loses with Tampa. And I saw he he came to the press conference like in a plain white tee, <laughs> like the <laughs> most like I could give a fuck about this I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Oh my god. But yeah. um. Any, uh, anyway, very interested to see how he plays now. I, I mean, I know he's got Antonio Brown coming back, but uh, you know, they just signed Le'Veon Bell, who's completely washed. You know, Ronald Do- Jones has been you know an afterthought, and uh, you know Gronk didn't look too great um against the Saints, so. And those receivers didn't look good either. So I really want to see uh, how he looks these last two weeks without his uh, without his weapons. Do we also know that Cam that, uh, Cam Newton is two and zero all time against Tom Brady? Really? Oh, yeah. I guess both. Yeah, both the Patriots uh, Panthers games, one in Foxborough, one in Carolina. Yep, yeah, one of them actually. Uh, Phil Phil attended the one in 2013, and the Patriots could have won the game, but there was a. Uh, non pass interference call at the end of the game, which made me like not like Cleet Blakeman at the time. And the 2017, Cam led the Panthers downfield and Graham Gano kicked a game winning field goal. So two and zero. Um I'm not saying the Panthers are gonna win, but I uh, I, I like I don't the points. Like, I like the points, but I also like the points when it was Bears and Bucks a couple months ago and then the hit the Bucks absolutely obliterated them. But with no Godwin, with no Fournette with Evans probably going to be banged up. I like the Bucs to win, but man, I like this 10 love. and a half point spread. I like, love. I love the 10. You know what? I love it. I think in my video on Sunday, you're probably going to see me saying Panthers plus 10 and a half. That uh, might be a max bet. Yeah, it might. It might. That might make my top five. Uh, because also the, the Bucs, the, the, that Bears game you're talking about. I know what you mean. I was on the Bears too that week. That game was in Tampa though. And yep. uh, just, Despite what happened yesterday, the Bucks have been like pretty mediocre on the road, and they've been excellent at home. And then, yeah, I mean, they had an overtime win against the Bills, and they lost to the Saints. So it hasn't felt like it in recent weeks. But their home road splits splits are pretty drastic. So going at Carolina again, another season on the line spot. Their season's probably already dead, but this is like literally their last chance, like their very last chance. And eleven points against a team that's going to run the ball a lot, kind of like how like they kind of kept they they should have covered against the Bills last week before they had a bullshit touchdown at the very end. Uh so I I think this is the kind of spot on the road without Godwin. You know, the Carolina defense is very good even though they don't always play like it. They they still are I think second in the NFL in yards per attempt allowed. So yeah, uh, give pl- uh, on on this app I'm looking at right now it's a plus 11 and I absolutely love it at plus 11. So yeah. Oh. If this was 10 or below, I'd probably take the box. But that half point or even two, if it gets to 11, that's just a huge difference. And also, uh, Tampa's record, they're 2-2 two and two in division, but they're 6-1 and one at home, and then they're 4-3 and three on the road. And all their, all their, when they lose, they lose solidly, too. All of their losses are by two scores. Like, last year, when they lost, they lost close, except against the Saints, obviously. The Saints, they got killed. But they lost to the Bears by one point. They lost to the Rams by three. And they lost to the Chiefs by three. This year when they lose, they lose like handedly. Like they've lost by 10. Yeah, 10 versus the Rams. Nine to the Saints twice. And then 10 to the football team. Yeah, and then nine to the Saints once. So two twice they lost by nine. But then even two, looking at some of their other victories, they haven't had a whole lot of like, besides I'd say probably the that one Giants game on Monday Night Football, the Bears game. Yeah, and they have a the lot Dol- of they have, the Dolphins they have, and then the first Falcons game. Like I even remember too. I'm gonna click on Week One. I just want to see what the exact spread was. I was, I said going into it, Tampa minus nine. I was like, I don't know if I like that against Dallas and Dallas covered. Yeah, they they they've won. They've also been very lucky in close games. They beat the Cowboys in a close game, the Patriots in a close game, the Colts in a close game, the Bills in a close game. They've been they've been getting a little lucky in these one score games. Exactly, but then all for all we know, this is all just going to be a chapter in the Super Bowl DVD that comes out sometime soon. <laughs> it's, it's just not going to be the same Bucks team, especially without Chris Godwin, man. That's his, that's his guy. That was Brady's guy, man. Their chemistry that they developed was, you know, it was really getting there. So that's I, that's, that's that would be a bigger that's a bigger loss than it would be Mike Evans out for the season. 
I also think it's a different Packers team too. Like the Packers are undefeated in Lambeau this year. Like they they won without they won against the Cardinals without any of their best receivers. Like I don't know. I think the Packers. I, I said this on the podcast before. They remind me a lot, a lot of the 2019 Chiefs. The 2019 Chiefs. They lost to the Patriots in the title game the year before, right? And no one trusted them. And they just developed like a. T- and in the next season, they weren't as flashy, but they were just they were more balanced on both sides of the ball. They were tougher. They were grittier. They were battle tested. They had playoff experience. And that's what it, it's just a lot a lot of parallels to this Packers team. They lost a heartbreaking loss in the title game at home. And then they're just, even though they're not as flashy, they're just like really balanced on both sides of the ball. Like I just, yeah, I think I, it's not the same Packers team either. Is I guess the point I'm trying to make. Not only is it not the same Bucks team, but it's also like the Packers of 2010 when they actually had a really good defense. Yeah, their defense played great. Russell Douglas out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty. Uh, good. Wait, and, 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 and they haven't too. had Jair. They haven't had Jair. Sorry to cut you off. They haven't had Jair Alexander also for most of the season, which is a huge loss. And yeah. they're missing David Bakhtiari on the O line as well. And they're still they're only getting better, man. And they're beating good teams. They're they like they beat the Rams handedly. They beat the Cardinals. Like they're 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 doing a good job. And I th- I th- I honestly think that that win against the Ravens, where they were like, oh shit, we almost lost this, man. I think it was more of them taking their foot off the gas pedal, more so of like the Ravens, you know, just being you know that good. So I think that's gonna wake them up a little bit and just be like, yeah, we got to come out and just fucking flat out dominate these teams now. No, I, I completely agree. Um, next game, Chargers and Texans. Like, do we think Chargers cover nine and a half points? Like, I'm sorry. Yes. I know he's got a good win last week. I don't know if I can see the Chargers winning this week. I know the Chargers and the Texans uh, winning against this week at all. I, I, I will say the um, – okay, look, look, look. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything crazy here. Um, this is no Herbert bias, I promise. Should be noted, uh, Joey Bosa, not going to play. Uh, on the COVID list, and they said he's definitely out, so that motherfucker is not vaccinated. So that is uh, something to note. He's not going to play. And uh, Nick, I'll, Speaker, but, if I cut you off for a second? Yeah, sure. Uh, Nick Bosa has basically, I'm pretty sure he's confirmed to be very far right on like some stuff he's posted on social media throughout last year in 2020 and stuff, so I'm not shocked at that at all. Yeah, it makes it, may, it does make a lot of sense based on the information we have on both of them beforehand. we will be interesting to watch with Nick. Um he better not get on the COVID list because if he does, like he's instantly out for 10 days. So like, especially the timing of it, if you get put on that list on Friday, like you could miss two straight games. Like if, if, if you do that, so he's got to be careful. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that I think the Texans are going to win or anything. It should be noted. Davis Mills is playing better. This isn't the Texans team of old. Like they, their offense has looked okay the last couple of weeks, their defense, their defense is still top 10 in DVOA. They're really good at forcing turnovers. So, you know, games in Houston, it wouldn't surprise me. I'll just say this. It wouldn't surprise me if it's a one-score game entering the fourth quarter. Now, do the Chargers score, you know, two touchdowns and pull away and cover? P- possibly. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me. I'll just, I'll just say that. Chargers yeah, win, though. I saw, I saw the Seahawks do it, you know, last week or the week before last week. Yes. So. V- very similar spot. Very similar. Um, just to give a little bit of uh, shine to a Texan man. Brandon Cooks is the most underrated wide receiver in this oh, yeah. league, bro. Another thousand yard season with 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 that situation. Like, come on, man. Let's give him some praise. He's not. He's now done it with four different teams. Uh, Insane, man. It's got to be a yeah, close to a record. Like, most underappreciated, underrated receiver in the league. You you, you know you know what that that's something to point out. That's kind of crazy to think. I've never truly thought about that with him. But no, like for this game, I can see a similar game. You know where. Say if it's like a four point game, but then like they get a touchdown to like maybe somewhere in the fourth quarter yeah. and just get that, just get that cover, like maybe win by like a 10 or 11 point margin. I could see something like that happening. Like a, uh, I don't know, give me like a, let's just say 24 to 13 kind of score. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds very right. Uh, that does sound very right. Uh, Texans, Is Eckler going to play or no? He's questionable. I don't know if, I don't know if it's confirmed that he's out, but he's questionable. Yeah, Wait, no, I, I just th- I just think after the after the loss the Chargers took against the Chiefs, they're just gonna come out and just blow the brakes off of the Texans. That's how I feel. You know what? Fair statement. Um, Bills at Patriots. Patriots are the favorites this time at two and a half points. I Ooh. think I know where both of you guys are going <laughs> on this, but I'll let you two speak and then I'll speak. Uh, I'll be quick. I don't really know what else to say. I just I've kind of thought this the whole time that they would split these games. I think it's really hard to sweep 
two games in a three game series. I know technically it's four because the Patriots had that bye week and the Bills played the Bucks in between. Uh, but either way, like I just think it's really hard to sweep these spots. Uh, I think the Bills are the better team. I think the Patriots were a little fortunate in some of their wins. Like they played this, they did not the the team, the Titans team that beat the Bills was not the Titans team that played the Patriots. They didn't have Henry. They didn't have A.J. Brown. They didn't have Julio. They had all those guys against the Bills. And even though Julio is a bust on the season, Julio was actually important that game. He got like a 50-yard catch that got them in the red zone uh, early on in that Bills game on Monday Night Football. So I I think they've been a little lucky. They played the Browns when the Browns were really beat up too. Um, I just think, I think, I don't, I think they're good. I think they're legit. I think they're playoff worthy. I don't know if I really believe that they're going to sweep what I still think is a good Bills team. So, yeah, I do think the Bills are going to win. They will probably make my top five. But, you know, I won't be, like, stunned if the Patriots win or anything. No, I'll, I'll give it to Danny. Yeah, no, uh, unfortunately, Max going to have to throw more than three passes this game to win. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> which is a bad thing. <clears throat> Honestly, I, I, I could see this game being just like the Colts game um, and, and uh, with better quarterback play from the Bills, obviously. So I think the Bills are going to come in here pissed off. I think they're going to feel robbed. Um, and I, I think they're going to put a beat down on the Patriots. Um, I know I did not listen to you last time. Uh, I know I didn't listen to you last time when you were telling me this about the Patriots and the Colts this week. Because um, I remember last year, it was a very similar result. Remember the, there was the game with Cam Newton where he fumbled. Bills yep. only won by three and then week 16. They stomped them, yeah. Yeah, we got stomped. I think it was like 38 to 9. Um, I, I Look, this is going to sound weird coming out of my mouth. I do think they split. I've always thought this from the beginning. But I wanted to win in Buffalo more just because that game was Monday night football in Buffalo. You know, a chance to go in there. And like like I said, and Big Rat tweeted out and tagged me in it a few weeks ago. Remember when I said, or you said it, you're like, big brother, little brother is still a huge thing in this rivalry. And I still agree right. with that. But I and- think this time... Let the oh, oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 you finish. You finish. I just said my part. So, my thing was going to be I think Buffalo comes in this time, they're pissed off. They remember what happened last time when we only threw three times on them and just ran up and down the field on them and won that game 14 to 10. Now, with that being said, I think this is going to be a much higher scoring game this time. I think that look, the over under right now, I believe, let me just look it up here. I th- think it's at yes it's at 43 and a half i think that could hit but patriots are known for their unders a lot of the time this year a lot of patriots unders have hit so if you're gambling on that one maybe push i'd say at around 43 44 but for the most part i do think that buffalo is going to come into england and get the win and that this is going to be uh this one's going to come down to the wire uh the last thing two two last points i'll add Firstly, on DVOA, which everyone knows I like bringing up on the show, here's how close these two teams are. So the Bills are third in overall DVOA. The Patriots are fifth. The op- offense, the Bills are 11th. The Patriots are 15th. Defense, the Bills are second. The Patriots are first. So across the board, these, these are pretty evenly matched teams. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I, one thing I noticed in that Monday night football game, and I told, and I told you about it on Twitter that Greg Bedard, who writes for the Boston sports journal, who, for those who don't know, I know, you know, Greg, who does great work. He said, in his opinion, McDermott, like takes these Patriots games, like really personally and like makes bad decisions that he doesn't make in other games. And, you know, you could kind of like last year when he beat the Cam Newton Patriots the first time and said, I'm going to go home with my wife and kids. I'm going to go enjoy this one when the Patriots were two and five at the time, because like that's how much of a mental block beating the Patriots was in his head. That first game, he he did some stupid ass stuff with his timeouts. He burned up. He burned a second half timeout for no reason. And then he challenged the he challenged a QB sneak by Mac that had absolutely no chance of getting overturned, literally zero percent chance. And he challenged it and cost himself an, another second half timeout. Timeouts they very desperately needed. They could have had another drive to maybe win that game. So if he if he like panics, you know, like and just like like gets really emotional because he so badly wants to beat the Patriots again and like does stupid shit like that, that could very well cost him in this game again, like it did the first game. So I would look out for that, uh, separate from the actual like football being played on the field. I, I completely agree with that. I think, look, if McDermott coaches with his heart, 
he's going to do something that's going to cost his team the football game. If he yeah. coaches logically and thinks it through, he's going to win. Like even to, I never minded McDermott as a coach, but even there was that footage from the first game where there was that egregious, unnecessary roughness call that he basically pointed out to the refs and then they threw a flag. That's why I'm so against like when guys complain about calls and then they'll throw a flag. It's just like little things like that, like even what happened. And even still in that game, I remember that time out being like, okay, what are you doing here? And uh, I feel like sometimes when it comes to that, look, they do too much to win that it can hurt your team more than it will help your team. Yeah. I totally agree. So that's all I got to say. But I still think at the end of the day that the uh, that the Bills are gonna that the Bills are gonna win. Um, uh, the team I'm watching right now, the Vikings and the Rams. So the Vikings basically playing for their playoff lives. Um, before I let you guys speak, I'm gonna say this quickly. I'm going Rams simply because I think the Vikings here are gonna do like what the Dolphins have done so notoriously. You know how last night they get the big win. They go into yep. this game, hey, you got to win this game to keep your playoff hopes alive. And then, like, you guys, like, remember the miracle of Miami? And then a week later, you went to Minnesota and laid an egg. And got I, can see very, I can see a very similar thing happening this week to the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, no, I want to see what the spread is. Um, the, the the Rams are such a hit and miss team, man. It's either they're firing all cylinders or, you know, they're struggling. They're losing right now to Seattle. So uh, Three points um, to the Rams. Definitely want to see the spread. I want to see if Thielen plays. That's another big factor. But uh, three. sorry to keep cutting you off. It is uh, L.A. is minus three. Yeah, minus three seems good. But uh, it's just the, the, the Rams are such a tough bet right now, man. You don't know which team's going to show up. So I, w- it, I would probably lay off this. I, I do think they win. Um, but it's not a for sure thing. It's kind of a reflection of um, – it's like a reflection of uh, Matt Stafford as a quarterback almost. It's like, you know, they – they have a high ceiling. They have a low floor. He could throw a game-winning touchdown. He could throw a pick six. You know, he you know he had a pick six in three straight games. Like that's earlier this year. The Titans, the tight. It was the Titans. The I'm trying to remember. It was Titans. Oh, yeah, it was Titans. The 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 Monday Night Football game against 49ers. Yeah, and then the Packers. The Packers. Yeah. So he's he's a high. And then he looks like he did against the Cardinals the second time where he looked great. So. Yeah, he's a high variance quarterback. They're a high variance team, uh, but I, I'm with you. I think um, I think Rams take it. You know, he's thrown less inter- in this game though. Uh, Kirk Cousins is thrown for less touchdown, but Stafford has three more picks. Really? Cool. <laughs> yeah. So Kirk Cousins is thrown for 29 touchdowns, but six interceptions. Stafford is 33 and nine. Uh, very similar uh, QBRs though. One, uh, not very similar actually. Stafford's 108.4, and Cousins is 101.9. And then uh, yardage is only about 300, 300 different. Stafford's almost a 400, and Cousins is at 3,600 right now. And I, I believe PFF PFF has Kirk higher. So, yeah, they're, they've been a lot closer this season than their reputations would suggest, to say the least. Uh, but, yeah, I, I like the Rams. Yeah, same. Um, Ravens and Bengals, 44.5 over under. Bengals are a minus 2.5 favorite. Um, the take I was going to have from earlier with the Ravens, does Tyler Huntley give the Baltimore Ravens a better chance to win than Lamar Jackson does right now? No, 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 no. I, I look, I, I get, I get what you're going to say. Like, does he give them a better chance than how Lamar was playing? Like in that Browns game on Sunday night football against the dolphins? Yes. Tyler Huntley is better than that. I don't think we're going to see that the whole year. And Early in the season, it can't be forgotten that uh, early in the season, Lamar was like on a tear. Like he looked like the best quarterback in football, like in that Chiefs game and the Colts game on Monday Night Football. So I would say no. And I would also say that Tyler Huntley like struggled to move the ball against the Bears a few weeks ago. Like it was a great performance, an absolutely epic performance, but it was still just one game. They, they need Lamar. All right. All right. But for this game, though, you know, I know we say divisional sweeps are hard. I think I got to go with the Bengals to win this game, though. Uh, the Bengals, another hit and miss team, man. Like, they, they come out and they lose to the teams like the Jets, you know. Um, they almost lost to Drew Locke last week. But um, if, if, if Lamar's ankle is good, uh, I think they got it. I think they'll take that. They basically, the the Bengals, they lose to the teams that they're supposed to beat, and they beat the teams they're supposed to lose to. Like, remember how everyone thought the Ravens were going to beat them the first yeah. time, but then they got walked? In in Baltimore. In Baltimore. Yeah. 
I, I think I'm going to pick the Ravens too. I, I would, it would not surprise me at all if the Bengals win. In fact, you could argue the Bengals have looked maybe slightly like the better team than Baltimore has this year. Uh, but I, there's just something about Baltimore. Like, like that's how you almost beat the Packers with Tyler Huntley. They just have like this toughness to them. Like, like they know that they need to win this game. It is, I don't think people realize how dire it is if Baltimore loses. It's not just that they probably won't win the division. Like they don't have a lot of tiebreakers with the wildcard teams. They don't have tiebreaker with the Raiders. They don't have a tiebreaker with the Dolphins. They only, they have a tiebreaker with the Chargers, but like, they don't have a lot of good tiebreakers. So if they don't win the division, they're they're in real danger of missing the playoffs altogether. So I just think I think even if the Bengals are the slightly better team, you know, John Harbaugh is going to give them the rally speech all week. Hey man, our season's on the line. We got to do this. We got to do this. And I think I just trust them a little bit more. I, I got burnt when the Bengals played the Steelers the second time. I got burned. I was one of those people who bet the Steelers. Um, because the Steelers this year have been pretty good as underdogs. They covered against the Browns. They cover, I mean, they won outright against the Browns, run outright against the Titans. They covered against the Chargers. Uh, they won outright against Baltimore. So they've been pretty reliable in that spot. So they played the Bengals and it was the same thing. They were like three point underdogs. The Bengals beat them up the first time. And I bet on a Pittsburgh bounce back and the Bengals just killed them again. And it was a very impressive resounding win. So maybe the Bengals are just that much better than this division. And they do it again. They're three and one in the AFC North, I believe. Uh, but I again, same with the Titans against the 49ers. Show me. Show me, and I'll believe. Because uh, for now, I think Baltimore – I was on the Bengals last week, but I think Baltimore has too much toughness to just to just let their season go away from them here. So give me the Ravens, though no, no problems with taking the Bengals either in this spot. So the Ravens – so the Bengals are 3-1 and one in division play, and then in conference play they're 6-3. and three. The Ravens are five and five, but the Ravens are one and three in division play. So I think if they do lose this game, there there is no they're way cooked. they win the. They're cooked to win yeah. the division. They're basically cooked. So you know what? I know I said I like the Bengals, but I think I got a flip flop. I I just think look, I think when their backs are against the wall, I think that's when the Ravens can be very dangerous. Agree. Like, oh, it's Sony Michelle going for a run here against this uh, sec- Seattle secondary. Um, and that is it for the one o'clock window. Next up, we have Chicago and Seattle. Um, Long window. Pardon me. A lot of games, man. A lot. There's a lot of games. Oh, Gary game Gilbert play. sucks. Did he throw a pick in that game? Yeah. Ah, oh, damn it. You spoiled well, it for me. All right. Well, I mean, I, well, you didn't spoil it for me because I asked. So who am I to complain? <laughs> that's all good. Um, but with this game, Seattle, Chicago, like, is there any hope in hell Chicago wins this? <laughs> yeah, there's a chance. Uh. There's a chance just because Seattle's not that good. And I, I would probably take the Bears plus seven. I know that sounds crazy, but like Seattle, like again, they just have a hard time covering big spreads because of how they play. Uh, so, yeah, they have a chance. But I mean, you know, I'm not picking them to win. I'm picking Seattle. Yeah, um, I am picking the Bears outright to win. Because you want the draft pick to improve? No, no. I just, I don't know. I think, I think at the end of the game last night, I think. Uh, they discovered a little something with Justin Fields, and they finally let him throw the ball downfield, and, and it worked. And you can do that on Seattle. I mean, I know it's not really working for the Rams tonight, but every other game I've watched, you know. And, you know, the, the Texans kept it competitive with them till the very end. Um, I think the Bears are better than the Texans. Uh, I think the defense really tried to win last night, but the offense was just holding them back, and then they finally just ran out of gas. But if they change up the game plan, they, uh, you know, take the handcuffs off Justin Fields, I think they win this game. This could be the kind of game where Russ gets sacked like five times. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Robert Quinn having a really good year this year. He's almost, I think, two and a half sacks now behind, um, I forget, the Richard Dent for uh, all-time sacks of the season. Wow. Yeah, I know. He's playing great. It's crazy. He's been in the league for a long time. Like, he's not a young player. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, quickly though, my, for some reason, so I'm on my score app and there's no, there, the odds aren't listed. What is the over under for this game? Uh, I can tell you in one second. I was just a because what, whatever it because in the four o'clock window because I I don't I Danny and I were talking about this before so I've been doing four bets all in one ticket. What I think I'm going to do this weekend is do two bets in the one o'clock window and then do two bets in the four o'clock window. And I honestly, and a half. you know what I think I under forty three and a half. I think that's the way to go for this game though. Yeah, I agree with that pick. Yeah, because you look, Bears unders have been hitting like crazy this year. 
The, I think the only time, like the only times I've gone over was uh, in games I've either gotten killed in, but like I think the Rams game, uh, Rams, the box, the one loss to the 49ers, the Steelers. Besides that, there and also the Cardinals lost, but a lot besides those games and the Packers game. Besides those, though, a lot of their games they have been not getting over forty points yeah. combined. Like, looks like even like, I know, like obviously, look, they put up thirty against the Packers, but I think I just can't see it. But I, I think the yeah, you know what? I think the Bears can win this game. I think he, uh, Wilson's going to have a just get sacked a lot, but at the same time, too, uh, for give me forty three and a half in the over under, um, Broncos and Raiders. Uh, like you guys know, I feel about Drew Locke. Uh, give me, give me the Raiders. I know I, 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 I curse up and down, uh, curse up and down the street about Derek Carr and his horrible interception that cost me the spread last night. But uh, I just don't trust Drew Locke. Yeah, no, I'm gonna go Broncos. Not with Drew, not not because of Drew Locke, just because of the defense and uh, j- the combo of Javante and Melvin. Um, you know, the the Raiders almost lost to Nick Mullins, who probably had no reps with with. Uh, or not a lot of reps with these guys. So, you know, Drew, Drew, Drew Locke's been there for, you know, these guys know Drew Locke. Um, their defense is a lot better than the Raiders' offense is. Um, and, you know, the uh, the Browns kind of exposed the game plan. You just got to shut down Hunter, Hunter Renfro and Derek Carr struggles. So if they, uh, if they do that game plan, I think they win this game. Exactly. And also, dude, yesterday, I don't know if it was just me, but, man, Colton Miller did not look that good for the Raiders either. He did not. Uh, and I thought the Raiders looked very bad yesterday. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised by it. I took Browns plus three. Uh, but I, 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 let's give Nick Mullins some credit. I thought he played OK, like uh, given the circumstances. His numbers aren't great, but like he had a lot of drops. He had he had some DPIs that could have been called. The play calling was pretty conservative early on. I, th- I thought he was fine. Uh, I thought he wasn't that much worse than whatever Baker Mayfield would have done in the same spot based on how Baker's played this year. Uh I, this is a coin flip. Do we know if Darren Waller's coming back? Like, that obviously matters because uh, he didn't play last night. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that question just yet. I think I think it's close. I think the Raiders do – don't get me wrong. I think the Raiders definitely suck. But I don't know if Drew Locke <laughs> – I don't know if Drew Locke is the kind of guy to expose it, though, is the problem. So I'll tentatively take the Raiders. Don't love it. But I will probably pick against the Raiders both of the last two games of the season. Definitely going to pick against them against the Broncos. I mean, against the Colts and probably against the Chargers too. So you're getting your horses mixed up, Big Rat. Um, before we get to the next couple of games, I just want to. Sh- so I don't know if you guys saw this, but Cole Beasley tested positive, so he's not going to be playing on Sunday. And he tweeted the, and he basically made a note and posted this on Instagram. Just to be clear, COVID is not keeping me out of this game. The rules are: Vax players are playing with COVID every week now because they don't test. One of my Vax teammates is in the hospital, missing games. I'm sure he didn't get the same energy. Thank you for those who support everyone else. If you don't get what's happening, then nothing – and there is nothing anybody can do for you. So I just want to leave that at that. I saw it on Twitter, courtesy of Zach Cox from uh, the New England Sports Network. Obviously, I know Big Rat. You know who he is. No, yeah. The, the, and by the way, that, that's like – that's not, not a small loss. Like, he's a very important part of their offense. Like, I – Whenever Josh Allen is having a bad game, he usually peppers him with targets over and over and over again. He did that against the Dolphins the second time where he would always just throw to Cole Beasley on third down and bail him out of trouble. So I definitely think, like, even though I'm picking the Bills, I definitely think that loss matters. It, it does. I just didn't want to say anything about it. Uh, but Because also Devin Singletary finally had a good game on uh, Sunday against Carolina. Um, we were talking about this earlier off air, and this is probably one of my favorite bets of the week along with Danny. Steelers at Chiefs, Steelers at plus 10. I, especially if there's no – if either one of Hill or Kelsey is not going to go on Sunday, you, you got to take the Steelers to cover that. I don't know oh, if they'll yeah. win the game, but, man, and I know Big Rat, we talked about this. I know Kansas City has been pretty well at covering the last few weeks, but we know how, how not good they can be against the spread, though. Yeah, it's, it's close for me. You're right. This is normal. Every week, I normally hammer any team that's catching 10 points against the Chiefs. And I've been betting the Steelers a lot of short dogs this year. But it's close for me because I don't know who's playing. Um, I want, like, the Chiefs, the Chiefs' COVID situation, we, it could get worse, you know. This could be the kind of thing where we get seven more tests tomorrow. So I want to wait to get more information. I do think the Chiefs are going to win. 
it wouldn't surprise me if the Steelers lose here solidly. And then on Monday night football, the next week they play the Browns in what, what is going to be big Ben's last home game in Pittsburgh. Like I could see them losing and then like rebounding with an emotional last win of the season against Cleveland and then losing to Baltimore week 17 finishing. If that, if that happens exactly like that, they would finish eight, eight and one, which would be a pretty perfect summation of their season. So uh, give me, give me, uh, give me, what was I going to say? Give Chiefs, me Chiefs win, Steelers Chiefs, cover. Chiefs win, cover. I don't know. I need to see who's out. Um, if, if the Chiefs lose a lot more guys to COVID, then yeah, give me Pittsburgh to cover. If not, I think it's close. I think this game could be decided by like exactly 10 points. So Do we think though this game could get moved if the Chiefs lose more people? Yeah, because the Steelers, like I said, the Steelers, because they play on Monday Night Football the next week, it's not going to be like, like the Eagles complained, you're putting us on a Tuesday, then we have to play Sunday. If you put the Steelers Chiefs game next week, Tuesday, the Steelers don't have to play till the following Monday Night Football. So it's not quite as bad. Uh, so yeah, I think this game could get moved for sure. All right, I just wanted to ask, because obviously next week there's all Sunday, and then there's the one Monday, because uh, the Chiefs' next game is on the Sunday at the road in the Bengals, which that's a, that's a very sneaky game. Uh, but, you know, I think Danny and I are both the same here, where it's uh, Chiefs cover, win, yeah. but, but Chiefs cover. Give me the uh, point. No, Steelers cover, excuse me. And then football team and Dallas Cowboys. Um, I'm going to say this right now. If Garrett Gilbert is the quarterback, give me Dallas yeah. at plus 10.5. But if... Yeah. If Heineke comes back, that could I. If, if Heineke comes back, uh, I think that spread gets bumped up a bit, or bumped down. Excuse me. Yeah, he should be. Back. He almost played tonight, honestly, so he should be back. Yeah, I would, and I, and even if not, like if um, if Kyle Allen comes back, then Kyle Allen could uh, Kyle Allen could could get the start instead. So, I I think it's uh, I think it's probably unlikely that Gilbert plays, uh, but. Yeah, I agree. If he does play, fade him. If Kyle Allen plays, probably fade him too. Like, I don't like him that much either. Uh, if Heineke plays, it's going to be closer. Uh, if Heineke plays, I'd probably take the football team to cover. But uh, def- definitely Cowboys win, though. I cannot see a football team win here. Like, Honestly, this game should be flexed out, especially if, if Washington loses here. Dallas. Right here. It's Dallas. They, they fucking love Dallas. Yeah, it's ridiculous, man. <clears throat> they should definitely be Patriots-Bills. It's they like could, how- they should. They should have flexed out Packers Bears a few weeks ago, but like, like the reason why the Bears are always on prime time is because Chicago is such a big market. Like, like every year it's the same thing. Everyone bitches on Twitter, like, why are the Bears in prime time again? Because they get they get like four prime time games every year automatically for being in Chicago. So similarly, it doesn't seem like they care who Dallas plays. Dallas draws <laughs> ratings, so yeah. And um, we haven't been on Sunday Night Football in ten years. I, my team hasn't been in four, and Miami's a big fucking market, too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great. Can I say something, though, about the numbers last night? What? So across a- a- ABC, ESPN, and ESPN Deportes, the Vikings-Bears game is the most watched Monday Night Football Week 15, ga- week 15 game in a decade with 15.9 million views. That's terrible. <laughs> That's just going to j- – now we're going to get five primetime Bears, game ne- Bears games next year. That's awful. Unbelievable. Well, you know we're it, like that's the thing though, and I agree with this because I know last year, um, the that was the first time I think ever the Cowboys were flexed out because Week 15 they were supposed to be Sunday Night Football against uh, I think it was San Francisco, but both were bad yeah. at the time, so that was flexed out. But I know there are certain teams the NFL will not, and even still Jerry Jones was pissed about getting flexed out. So there's always certain teams, in my opinion, that will stay in the what's the word I'm looking for? There are always certain teams they won't flex out, like Chicago, for example, this year four primetime games and then I'm not trying to sound bad either, but the Patriots have only had the one Sunday nighter. Like even that week, that last week, man, Bill's block should have been the Sunday nighter, not, not Packers bears. It should have and been also the, the, like the week before they flexed out Niner Seahawks for Broncos chiefs and Niner Seahawks ended up being the better game. Yeah. Even to what Raven Steelers could have been the Sunday nighter that week. Yep. Yep. Also would have been more fun. Exactly. And then uh, next week, Sunday night or two, Vikings Packers, which uh, get I don't that. Know about that. Yeah. And then Monday night, Big Rat, your boys, Miami, playing it and playing in the dome in what I'm going to call a true loser leaves town game. Both teams are sitting at seven and seven right now. I will say this. So I feel like if the Saints go to seven and eight, they can win their last two games, in my opinion, against Carolina and uh, Atlanta to and go to a nine and eight. I think for you guys, this is more of a must win game, but. Let's see your thoughts on it as Tua's 94.3 QBR goes up against Taysom Hill's 61.7. The, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I feel decent about it. Uh, I, I'm look. The Dolphins need to win out to make the playoffs. I think most like do- most reasonable Dolphin fans like are not expecting us to win out. It just seems like they will slip up somewhere. I think it's more likely they slip up next week against Tennessee because it's on the road. Tannehill revenge game and the Titans. I just think the Titans are going to start getting guys back next week. They already might get AJ Brown back this week. So I just think it's very, very possible that they, you know, the rumor was Derrick Henry comes back week 18, but what if as a surprise, they bring him back week 17, that, especially if they lose on Thursday night football, they might rush him back to week 17. So that would obviously change a lot. Uh, so I, I'm not super confident about the Titans game, despite how they've looked uh, the saints. Yeah, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be confident because I think the offense will struggle. I think, you know, obviously we all saw Sunday Night Football. We saw the Bucks' offense struggle. I, I A lot of people excuse that because Godwin Evans and Fournette got hurt. I don't think that's a good excuse because Godwin and Evans played the entire first half and they scored zero points in the first half. They punted six times and had a missed field goal. When those guys were healthy, it's not like they were close to scoring anyways. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten shut out. But I think they would have only scored like seven or ten points. It's not like if Godwin and Evans were healthy, they were about to rip off 30 in the second half. I just don't believe that for a second. So the defense is legit. Our offensive line is horrible. Tua makes the old line look better than it is. There's a lot of Dolphin beat writers who try to kind of – who don't like Tua, who keep saying like, oh, the offensive line isn't as bad as you think. Yes, it is, everybody. They are 32nd in pass block win rate according to ESPN, and they are 32nd in PFF grades. So they are the worst offensive line in football, and there's a lot of bad ones out there. Tua just gets rid of the ball so quickly that he doesn't get sacked very often. And people, I think, incorrectly credit the O-line for that when it's really the quarterback. Because go watch a Dolphins game when Jacoby Brissett is the quarterback, and you'll see they give up like six sacks. Like, it's ridiculous. And if if it's not a sack, it's him rushing into a throw and throwing an interception because he doesn't get rid of – he doesn't make quick decisions like Tua does. So – I think the offense will struggle. I mean, I'm, I'll be rational about that. I think Jalen Waddle is going to come back, which is going to help a lot. And he's already off the COVID list. So I think the offense, Monday night football on the road against a tough defense. The two script is very predictable every week. They're awesome in the first quarter. They're awesome in the fourth quarter. Last week was a weird exception. He was terrible in the first quarter. Terrible. I'll say it. Terrible. He threw a bad pick and he threw two other passes that should have been intercepted. And then in the second and third quarter, though, I thought he was really good. I thought he was actually one of his better performances of the year because he started making a lot of those downfield touch throws. He made a 37-yard throw to Devontae Parker, a 30-yard throw to Isaiah Ford, um, which was like touch, like right ball right in the right place. And then in the fourth quarter, he threw like almost a game losing pick six. So last week was the reverse of the normal Tua script of be great in the first quarter, be great in the fourth quarter, be terrible in the middle of the game. Uh, Last week was the inverse of that. So... I think he's going to play well. I think they're going to do well. But I also just kind of think that – I also just kind of think that um, that, uh, their their offense is going to struggle even more. That's kind of my prediction, that Taysom Hill, he's obviously – like it kind of went under-discussed how bad he was on Sunday Night Football. Like he was – they could not do anything. He was horrible. We just didn't notice because because the Bucs were so much worse. But according to – EPA per play, Taysom Hill was actually worse than Brady in that game. Not every metric says that. A lot of metrics will say Taysom was better, but EPA per play will say that Taysom was even worse than Brady was. And Brady's offense scored zero points and he turned it over twice. So I think uh, this is my long winded way of saying I think our offense is going to struggle. I think their offense is going to struggle even more. This could be a very weird, like 13 to 10 kind of game. And I think Taysom Hill could give the Dolphins some short fields. And I think that's going to be the difference. I think he's going to, he should have been picked like three times in that Bucks game. And if you notice, the game plan against Lamar Jackson, when they did the zero blitz and blitzed everybody at the line of scrimmage, it was effective because Lamar can't scramble up the middle because there's like 10 bodies there. And they had some really good edge players that were really good at limiting him to the outside, like Jalen Phillips, our first round defensive end, who's very fast. And Jerome Baker's very fast for a linebacker. They were very good at tackling him on the edges if you ever, if you ever scrambled out left or right. But he couldn't scramble up the middle because there was 10 guys blitzing. And Lamar Jackson does not have like a rock rocket arm. So when you blitz all those guys, the quarterback backs up. They take like five to 10 steps backing up and they have to throw. And he doesn't really have the arm strength to throw a bomb down the field like that, like Josh Allen would, like Patrick Mahomes would, like Matt Stafford would. So 
it kind of ended up being an effective game plan for him because he wasn't making quick enough decisions. He wasn't adjusting to what was happening that the Dolphins were, it's not just that they were blitzing. They were doing it like every single play. It was, it was egregious. Like it was, you don't see that in the NFL. I think Taysom Hill, his arm is terrible and he's not accurate to begin with. So it's the kind of thing where if they're blitzing and he can't scramble and he has to back up five to 10 steps and has to throw that's pick city for Xavier and Howard. That's pick city for Javon Holland. So I think both offenses are going to play bad. I think our defense is going to – basically, I think their offense is going to make more mistakes than ours will. I know two is, two is liable for a terrible interception every week, but I think Taysom Hill could be liable for two or three in this game, or four like he had against Dallas. And I think we'll have enough short fields, we'll kick enough field goals, and we'll probably win a 13-10 to 10 kind of game. You know, I, compl- I completely agree with that. I Like, the over-under right now is sitting at uh, – 30, I think it was 39. Yeah, it's 39 and a half. Let me just double check that. Uh, sorry, folks. We go live here. Uh, apps take forever to download. So, yeah, the uh, over under for this one. Yeah, 39 on the dot. I, I, I got to take that. I think, look, spread. I don't know what I want to do yet. Uh, I'm going to wait and see. Depending, too, on health, for example, like with the Saints, uh, obviously they were without two of their top offensive linemen last week and Ryan Ramchek and Teron Armstead. So, we'll see what happens there. But, yeah, I think this game. You said the exact same score. I don't know if you remember this, Big Rat. The Saints Seahawks Monday Nighter from a couple months ago. I could see a very similar game inside the dome Monday night. Yeah, I can see that. And then from the outside uh, party, where's Daniel? Well, he, he's right. going to predict. He's going to predict the Saints to win. We know that. But let, let's. I'm going to predict the Saints to win because because they do have the best rushing defense in the league, and Jordan Howard absolutely saved you guys against the Jets. Tool was absolutely Duke awful. Johnson. Duke Johnson. Outside, yeah, I'm sorry, Duke Johnson. Um, Tua, Tua was Tua was terrible, bro, before Duke got going. So um, Duke's not going to be able to have that game. Gasson's not going to be able to have that game. Um, it is going to be a low-scoring game. Just flip your score and give me the Saints. Uh, I think Kamara has a big game as well. I, I will say, Tua, like, um, he, Tua was playing, like, really well for, like, a month before that game. Like, and I do think he was good in the second quarter. And in parts of the third quarter. But, like, what you saw, he, he doesn't do that every week. That was his first multi-interception game of the season. Like, he he really doesn't play like that every week. Like, so I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't expect exactly that. I would expect the two you got in the first Jets game, you know. Except not scoring as often because it's the Saints defense, like you said, instead of instead of the Jets defense. You know, you know, I... I think I want to go – I think I can see a world where the Saints win this, but I also think this is an opportunity for a letdown spot. You know you got a big win. You didn't expect to win. Like, remember when the Saints beat the Bucs uh, a couple months ago, but then the last, next week they lost to the Falcons on a late field goal? I can see a very similar game to that here. I, I think – look, hopefully my dad doesn't hear this, so he's going to kill me, but he'll probably end up listening to this anyway. Um, I, I, could, I just see a world where the Dolphins win this game, but at the same time, too, it would not shock me at all to see the Saints win this game, and that rush defense is what the difference is. Um, Big Rat, the only thing I can see with this game as well is not only like the Saints-Seahawks game, but the Patriots-Dolphins game in the sense of, you know how that one Damian yep. Harris fumble won you the game? I can yep. see a situation here where it comes down to, hey, which offense can screw up the least? And like that, t- Yeah. Like, it's, like, like the Saints, the Saints are down 13-10, it's third down. They're in the red zone. You know, if they just throw an incomplete pass to kick a field goal, we go to overtime. But instead, Taysom Hill throws a red zone interception to Byron Jones or Xavier Howard or something like that. You know, like you could totally see that. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that exact same thing, though. Uh, yeah. Who, which offense screws up the least? I agree. I just want to look and like maybe maybe Taysom Hill will prove me wrong. I mean, certainly it wouldn't surprise me if he just like runs over. Like, the Dolphins' run defense now is good. It wasn't for a large part of the season. So if he rushes for 100 yards, it's not like I'll be so stunned. Um, But just remember, Sean Payton, offensive genius, he started Trevor Simeon over him for four straight games. And I think on Sunday, we're kind of seeing why. Like, I think he didn't trust Taysom to be an every week starter now that teams had some film on him. And I think that... I think that uh, I think they, they didn't trust him to be an every week starter. And I think now it's, you know, now it's a little different. Um, and so I think we should just keep that in mind. Like, why didn't Sean Payton start Taysom Hill when Jameis got hurt? Why did he start Trevor? And he didn't just start Trevor. He started Trevor for like a month. 
And I think maybe it was because maybe Trevor's better than Taysom. And I mean, he certainly, he certainly looked like it on Sunday because Taysom could not do anything, anything against the Bucks. So maybe that, that's kind of how I'm seeing it. I'm not, I'm not here to defend Tua. I'm not here to defend the offense. I'm here to say that Taysom against our defense will make more mistakes than Tua against theirs. Danny thinks the flip. We'll all find out on Monday Night Football. 100%. That's, that, that's just how it is. Um, but anyway, guys, um, does anyone have anything else to say? Anything else to comment on? Oh, actually, before we go, I was right. Um, Big Ray, I want to ask you about this. Remember one of your first appearances on here, and I said how long until Mario Cristobal coaches Miami? Yep. Uh, well, never, we're here yeah. now. Here we are. It's been a running, it's been a running joke amongst my Miami friends for years. Like in 2018, some one person in my group chat found a text in 2018 where he texted Oregon was beating Stanford like handedly, and he texted the group chat, "Future head coach Mario Cristobal is beating up Stanford right now." And yeah, it was. This was always going to happen one day. It was just a matter of when. And here we are. And I'm happy we're here. Exactly. I don't know what the buyout was. If it was as bad as Lincoln Riley, uh, it was eight mil. Oh, Emil, no, but you know how it was like, did they buy his houses? Does he get oh, like 20 no. bucks on access to the private jet? Like, that was just no, fucking no. absurd. Jeez, but also, nothing like that. But Markeem looked at it like this way. Yeah, he thinks Lincoln Riley is escaping the SEC. Yeah, it, it seems like that. I mean, because USC does not have, even though Dart is good, like, he had, like, Caleb Williams was the number one quarterback in the country. Like, he was set up offensively. USC hasn't won in years. Like, a lot of those players aren't ready like to make like a big Pac-12 championship run. Like, yeah, I mean, aside from money, I can't really think of another reason why he, he wouldn't just do that. Yeah. For, if not for that. To leave I got to, I got to think money and just the overall sex appeal of a city like LA, if maybe one day he wants to, you know, make the jump to the NFL. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. And then, uh, since I don't know if you, uh, I don't know, I, I've never really gotten engaged on how big of a college football fan Danny is, but Big round. What do you think is going to happen? Uh, we can ask Danny too for his opinion on this. What do you think is going to happen in the college football playoff next week? I, I think it's going to be boring. I think it's going to be Bama Georgia again, and I think Georgia is going to win the rematch this time. I think, I think Bama is going to. I think Cincinnati is going to cover. I think they're going to play Bama tougher than people think because even though their defense is not better than Georgia's, there's a lot of smart people who think Cincinnati's secondary is better than Georgia's secondary. Like Cincinnati has a lot of cornerbacks that are that are going to play in the NFL, so I think they match up better with Bama in that way because the way Bama beat Georgia was by throwing down the field a lot, and they're not going to have John Mechie in this game. So I think Cincinnati's secondary is going to surprise some people. I think they're going to play decently well, and I think it's going to result in Cincinnati covering but still losing. I think Georgia's going to beat Michigan. I don't think Michigan's offense like. Bryce Young was throwing bombs against Georgia. It's how he won the Heisman. Michigan's offense isn't built to do that. They're built to win on power running. And Georgia's like the best defense in the country at stopping that. They're for, their defensive line is the best in the league. So I think uh, Georgia, Michigan's not equipped to take advantage of Georgia's vulnerabilities like Bama was. And Georgia's well equipped to beat Michigan's strength. So I think it's going to be Bama, Georgia. It's going to be the rematch. The narrative is going to be, can Kirby Smart finally do it? Can he finally beat Bama after failing and choking like so many times? And I think he finally gets it done in the rematch because I think their defense can play a hell of a lot better than it played in the SEC title game. And just a gut feeling, uh, just a gut feeling. Georgia Bama again, this time Georgia finally gets it done after everyone counts them out for getting blown out the first time. No, I agree with that. Danny, do you have anything to add on to that? And no, I haven't watched any college football this year. I work on Saturday, so um, it's kind of been tough for me. But I would say Bama, from what I do know. All right, all right. I, I got you, I got you. But anyway, Danny, I don't know if you know this, but I saw apparently for the sports books for New York, there's a bunch that are going to launch either sometime in January or early February. I think the eight. I think the oh January 8th? No, no, can't wait. Oh, can't wait. Okay. Um, I think what it is is basic, but it's not just like one launching. I think I saw like WinBet, FanDuel, MGM. Like there's a bunch that are just going to launch all at the same time. I think DraftKings is in there as well. Yep. Yeah. The only one I heard though, apparently uh, a little sketchy results about that was the Barstool one. I don't know if either of you have used that. No, but Barstool didn't get the license. Yeah. So you have to go over to Jersey for that one, but. That's just something I figured I'd share. So we'll see what happens. Because I remember when I was in New York, York State, is charging a fifty-one percent 
um, cut to all these uh, to all the books. So all their profits, they're getting fifty one percent of that. Keep in mind, they also take thirty eight percent of our winnings. So New York is absolutely r- raping, you know, both of us. Jesus, I feel like still though the sports book won't like sports books in the states. I don't think will seriously take off or m- more profit than they already have until they hit three big states, and those are Florida, Texas, and California. Yeah, and Florida Hard Rock. Hard Rock Casino down here was given the rights to open up their own book, and they were. It was very popular down here, very popular. All my friends were using it. They were pounding bets, making good money, and uh, they had to close down because like an injunction was filed that like them having the book in the manner they did was like mon- monopolistic behavior. Even though they were okay with the book existing legally, like they thought it was like a an antitrust violation or some shit like that. So now we have to wait until that legislation sorted out for it to come back. But yeah, it's not it's not here in full just yet. Jesus, that sucks. Because I remember yeah. when I was in uh, I was in New York State a, a couple weeks ago, and I had to go to a casino to place my bets. But this is the same thing too with the sports book, where you just it's like you go to the machine, you line up. It's like betting on the horses and stuff. And I also know with uh, Big Red that whole Hard Rock, the Seminole one, they bought the Mirage in Vegas, so they'll be opening up a casino there too. I think sometime next year. Yeah, yeah, should be good. Looking forward to it. Yep. Yeah. Well, anyway, guys, that's gonna wrap it up for. Uh, Episode number 140 of YWC Football Talk for everybody out there. Have a safe and happy Christmas. holidays. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas to you guys. Yeah. And enjoy the week of football, guys. We'll see you next week for a full Week 17 slate and a more in-depth look into the college football playoff. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.